Welcome to Work 23, a half-day virtual symposium to help leaders anticipate the challenges they will face in the big shift. I'm Abby Lundberg, Editor-in-Chief of MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be moderating the event along with my colleague, Editorial Director Elizabeth Heichler. We'll host a series of presentations, panels, and fireside chats featuring new research and insights from some of the world's top thinkers on the future of work. Our speakers are academic researchers and senior executives, all chosen because of their unique and compelling perspectives, insights, and experiences. Many thanks to our event sponsors, Randstad Enterprise, HCL Software, and MIT Press for supporting this event. My friend and colleague, Elizabeth Heichler, will introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Abby. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, we've got a great crowd. Our uh, first speaker, Peg Nalbantian, is co-founder and co-leader of the Workforce Sciences Institute. A labor and organizational economist, he brings an evidence-based asset management approach to human capital management and developing and applying rigorous empirical methods to quantify and assess the workforce and business impact of human capital factors. Haig spent 25 years as a senior partner at the global consulting firm Mercer, where he originated and helped develop their practice in workforce strategy and analytics. Haig's talk this morning will delve into his most recent research on barriers to the effectiveness of employer DEI strategies and effective ways to overcome them. Welcome, Haig. What an honor it is to be a part of this uh, wonderful uh, summit and to have the opportunity to share some of the learnings um, about the use of advanced analytics um, with this uh, audience. I very much appreciate the invitation. You know, when we talk about the application of analytics and the surging use of analytics in the HR domain to inform work and workforce management is very much uh, a part of that future. And what I wanna speak to today is uh, how such analytics are already being used, and I'll pay particular attention to their application to issues around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. The perspective I bring comes from um, almost 35 years of working with client organizations, applying advanced analytics to solve workforce issues or problems, and to address and, and develop uh, workforce uh, strategies. Um, the methodology we use, and we'll, we'll get into this a little more in the Q&A session, uh, but the, the methodology is something we call internal labor market analysis, is very much focused on understanding the dynamics of, of how a workforce is created, who's coming in, how people are moving through an organization and progressing, who's staying and who's leaving, and how organizations value their employees for what they bring and uh, for how they perform. So um, in doing those models, typically we would analyze the drivers of retention, promotion, performance, and pay. We, of course, account for uh, the role of demographics. And what you will see in what I share is that we learn a lot about both what we call unexplained differences in what happens to people in different demographic groups, meaning even after you account for the multiple factors that influence those outcomes, there may be differences that remain related to race or to gender, um, as well as, and maybe even more importantly, the explained differences. So certain factors may influence those outcomes. Maybe it's educational attainment, maybe it's the role you're in, and those two can contribute to differential outcomes for, for different groups. And I want to speak today, I had the opportunity late last year to um, systematically review uh, multiple internal labor market studies I had done with clients to see what were the more generalizable and, and if you will, universal patterns in our work, typically in the human capital domain. Um, there aren't that many universals, surprisingly. Um, context matters a lot and what works in one organization may not work uh, in another or may actually work the other way. But we do find when it comes to DEI and the impact of demographics, there are some strong uh, universals. 
I'm going to briefly review with you the results of that survey I did of, of the various outcomes uh, of these ILM studies. And then I want to show you how organizations are and can use the um, results of advanced analytics to actually proactively intervene to try and create better outcomes. The review is 20 organizations. Um, they are a mix of large and mid-sized uh, companies. They are mostly global. Uh, they cover both manufacturing and the service sector. Collectively, about 700,000 employees uh, were covered in this study over multiple years. The typical uh, study was three to five years. And um, each analysis um, uh, involved the, the modeling of the, the likelihood of promotion, the likelihood someone gets a high performance rating, the likelihood someone stays or leaves the organization in a given period of time, and uh, pay levels. Uh, so first I'm gonna talk about the unexplained uh, disparities. And what you can see on this slide um, is that uh, there are some very consistent patterns at the top row. You can see uh, what we're finding for women and there's quite an anomaly here, which uh, is something I've seen in many, many assignments well beyond these 20. Uh, you'll say women are actually more likely to be highly rated. Uh, in this sample, 80% of the company, in 80% of the companies, women were actually uh, more likely to receive uh, high performance ratings, all else being equal. But you'll also see, if you look to the promotion uh, columns, that um, uh, in most of the organizations, the majority, they're less likely to be promoted. You know, that's uh, quite a contradiction, but something we see routinely. If you look at people of color, and I've highlighted what happens to black employees here, uh, the results are, are really quite stark, uh, significantly less likely uh, to be promoted uh, for black employees. Not in a single one of these companies were they more likely to promote it. You see that 0%. And if you look to the right on the ratings, virtually universal, uh, that they're less likely to get high ratings. And there are very few universals, as I uh, say, in the work we do, but this is one of them. I can go from assignment to assignment. Ratings and the inability of black employees to uh, get even to that normal distribution of, of, of ratings uh, is a major, major roadblock to their ability uh, to advance. So this is the unexplained part, and it uh, presents a rather, uh, uh, you know, unhappy view of what still goes on. These are mostly elite, large employers, um, and so one has to wonder if this is what the disparities look like in that part of the economy. What do they look like elsewhere? Uh, it raises some major questions. Notwithstanding these unexplained disparities there are explained differences that are really quite critical. And in, in my uh, judgment and in my experience, they're actually more important um, to the ultimate success of diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies than is simply getting rid of those unexplained differences that, that seem to, to reflect a bias. Um, and there are five that I'm gonna call out I don't have the opportunity, given the time constraints, to give you uh, examples of each of these. I'm going to focus in just on two with examples, but let me let me hit these topics uh, very quickly. The first one we've uh, we've already talked about performance ratings. So clearly, in most organizations, there is a an orientation to uh, have things driven by uh, performance, and uh, the rating an individual gets in any given year is very predictive of what else will happen to them, whether they'll be promoted, whether they stay with the organization, what their pay level uh, is, um, and even what their performance rating is likely to be in the future. We find a lot of persistency in performance ratings. So if you have a high performance rating this year, you have a much higher probability to, have a, to get high ratings, not only does that have an immediate effect on diminishing promotion probability and pay and retention, but it also suggests they're much more likely to have um, uh, 
low performance ratings in the following year. So it becomes almost a blockade. This imbalance cascades through the system and creates real uh, obstacles to career progression. Uh, so something our clients pay strong attention to when this finding is, uh, you know, is uncovered. You know, if they're not gonna, able to get to the bottom of this and understand what's going on here that makes this such a pervas pervasive pattern, they're really going to struggle to to make anything else work. Um, the second explained difference is relates to roles. In, in organizations, there are some roles that no matter who you are, if you touch them in your career, it it, it increases the likelihood that good things are going to happen to you from a career standpoint. And there are also roles um, which, no matter who you are, if you touch them in your career they're likely to depress the trajectory of your career progress. The challenge here is that all too often we find that women and people of color are less likely to be in those so-called accelerator roles. And I'll give you a sample, a very uh, a, a, a generic role is supervisory positions. We will find almost universally in our modeling that if you're a supervisor, if, if other people report to you, all else being equal, you're more likely to be promoted, you're more likely to get high ratings, you're more likely to be paid more. Most organizations value their supervisors. But you'll see that uh, women and people of color are less likely to be in supervisor roles. And for women, very often, even if they get to supervisor positions, it's later in their career relative to comparable men. And so they don't get the full benefit of that uh, lift to their career trajectory in the way that their male counterparts do. So it can be quite um, uh, damaging uh, to long-term equity for women in the organization. Reporting relationships also matter a lot. So who you report to matters. And we find in particular that all else equal, if you report to a high-performing supervisor, a rate, supervisor who has high ratings in the scale of each organization, you're more likely yourself to get highly rated and you're more likely to be promoted. Similarly, if you are reporting to someone who is higher up in the hierarchy than the typical reporting relationship, you're also likely to benefit uh, enormously. Now, when I look at the demographic lens on this, it's less consistent. So I won't tell you women are always less likely to be reporting up or be reporting to top performing supervisors or similarly for uh, people of color. But we do often see that. And when we see that, you realize, again, there is this systemic impediment to their ability to advance. Uh, so keeping your eye on reporting relationships is very critical. Uh, to being able uh, to do this. Internal mobility. So many organizations build their leadership development um, uh, systems and programs on the basis of mobility. The idea being, and it's a very reasonable idea being, that good leaders have breadth of experience, that uh, the more they know about the organization working in different geographies in different parts of the business, with different sets of employees and different sets of customers, that um, that builds breath, that tests their ability to perform. So if people are performing well in changing circumstances, maybe they have inherently better leadership capability. Uh, all of those are reasonable um, assessments and you, you can understand why you might build a leadership development platform on mobility. However, we all know that at certain uh, points in their lives, women may be less mobile. Uh, they, they still disproportionately bear caregiver status and um, you know, child rearing uh, and the likes may impair their ability to move on. So having a counterpart, being able to do things other than physically move um, may be really important for organizations if they want to ensure women are getting into leadership positions. So this can become a systemic block to the ability of women to succeed. And the final one, which is really more and more important in our post-COVID world, flexible work arrangements. Everyone is talking about them these days. 
Um, we've seen how they perform during COVID, and generally speaking, the the the, uh, the verdict is pretty positive. Uh, the productivity didn't wane too much with remote working, and that people being able to determine more how they work and where they work uh, is beneficial. But the red flag here is that historically, flexible work arrangements have been career killers for whoever takes them. Uh, being a, on part-time status associated with uh, reductions in promotion probability, ratings, retention, uh, and the like, remote work, uh, similarly, any kind of leave, uh, similar kind of status. So we've seen this uh, in organizations. Uh, the question is, has COVID changed that? Or will we see a reversion to that norm, so to speak? as COVID, the, the impact of COVID wanes. Something to be very much alert to, given how universal that negative impact has been, uh, at least historically. So I wanna give a few uh, examples here. Um, this one will focus on roles and supervisor. Um, th this is a large insurance organization, a global uh, company. And what I've done on this slide is simply focus on the um, situational factors. So we're controlling for all the other individual factors like the person's tenure, their educational level, uh, the, the location they're in, uh, et cetera. Uh, but here we're looking at roles, supervisor attributes, uh, and the attributes of team members. And you can see here, that there's a lot of green associated with the supervisor relationship. So, you know, if you are in um, a, um, a, a supervisor role or a client facing role, you see those greens, you know, more likely to get high ratings, much, much more likely uh, to be promoted. Um, if you are reporting to a higher level supervisor or in a highly rated supervisor, you can see the green there under ratings and uh, promotion uh, uh, probability. So those are all good things, um, which align with what I've just uh, said. The question becomes, are women and people of color likely to be in those situations? Are they in those roles? Are they reporting to those um, uh, kinds of supervisors? And our findings here were uh, virtually across the board, women and people of color we're less likely to be in those advantageous positions. And uh, the one other thing I'll point out on this slide, you can see under uh, team size, there's a big red there on promotion probability. Bottom line here in this organization, if you were part of a small team, all else being equal, you're much less bumped. What is it, 89% less likely to be promoted. Black employees in particular were much more likely to be in small teams. So the point here is there are these situational factors that in this organization thoroughly explain the outcomes, but are nonetheless working to the detriment of women and people of color, which provides a very tangible focal point for action. And uh, uh, very conscious of time with um, uh, part-time and, and uh, remote working here, you can see all the red across the board on part-time employment and, um, uh, and some red relating to being uh, out on leave in this organization, it really hurt you. This is another insurance uh, a company. Uh, it really hurt you to be on any kind of flexible working arrangement. So what do you do about this? There's something we call proactive career management that is an approach that takes the learnings from this kind of modeling and uses them to better support career development for employees and organization wishes to uh, nurture and have remain with them. So if you want people to stay and thrive, you kind of put this situational scan on your workforce and examine to what extent uh, uh, your diverse employees and, and employees you really uh, think represent your future are being positioned to succeed. And so what you see on this page, this is from a large uh, retail uh, consumer products uh, company. The two columns here, we have the top, uh, I, I believe it's the dozen 
uh, uh, predictors of success with respect to promotion. And on the quantity side that you see a Q column, we're talking about an internal labor market, so there are quantities and prices. Um, you see a lot of down arrows there. What does that mean? Uh, with respect to gender, this is saying that for many of those success predictors, those success factors, if you will, women are less likely to be in those positions, right? So in this company, being an expat was really important. Well, women are less likely to be expats. The P column, the price, reflects how those characteristics are valued for women as compared to men. And you'll see here, for the most part, there are dotted uh, lines there. It means no statistical difference. Um, the, so if a woman is, is an expat, she's as likely as her male counterpart to benefit from that um, as, it, as, as, as the male uh, counterpart. On the other hand, you look at supervisor role, you see two downward arrows. So women are less likely to be supervisors in this company. And guess what? Even when they do become supervisors, it doesn't benefit their careers in the same way, to the same degree, as it does their male counterparts. So you think of this as kind of a, a success profile where you're putting the demographic lens on it and you're saying, is the success profile for women the same as that of men, for uh, people of color the same as that of whites? And are the attributes that make for success valued in the same way uh, for both, um, for all demographic groups? And the way this can be implemented is with a simple checklist, there are really two ways. Uh, you can give um, managers and supervisors this checklist and say, be alert to these things. Um, and ask yourself the question, are you positioning your up and coming women, your up and coming um, uh, people of color to succeed in the organization in the same way as you are your white colleagues? This makes it very tangible because you know what those Re the um, green lights are, the things that are favorable to advancement are, and you know the red flags, the things that inhibit advancement. And you just want to make sure that, uh, that, you, that the talent you really want to keep and grow um, are not being systematically put in disadvantageous uh, positions. So I know we're, we're, we're close to the end of time here. I'm going to uh, uh, stop. Uh, key takeaways here are, you know, Talent and drive are, are very important in shaping careers, of course. The situational factors we find in our analytical work, those situational factors removed from the individual have profound, often inordinate effects on what happens to employees. Um, and all too often, women and people of color simply aren't being positioned to succeed in the same way as their white male counterparts. So it's not, um, it's not the same as unexplained disparities, it's simply that the avenues to success in the organization are not as open to them. The good news is in the age of analytics, we're in a position, most organizations, smaller ones, perhaps less, but uh, we're in a position to empirically evaluate what those success drivers are and how situational factors influence the outcomes. And we can therefore try to level the playing field in a very tangible way using proactive career management, actually monitoring and helping ensure that uh, employees understand what, what are the avenues to success and are getting those opportunities is really important. Fantastic, thank you so much, Haig. And uh, I want to, uh, we've covered a lot of material in 20 minutes there, so I'm happy to uh, report that uh, Haig has an article in the upcoming summer issue of uh, MIT Sloan Management Review that goes into a great deal more depth on the work that he's done. And we have had a lot of questions <laughs> for you. So I'm gonna dive right into some audience questions here. Um, a, a number of more a broader, and then uh, some, some really specific questions digging into your research. Um, Especially as we've we seen a lot of interest in the questions on, on the, the work from home and flexible work. Um, why would the impact of flexible work be different for women versus men post COVID? Asks um, this member of our audience. Is it because more men thought flexible work during COVID? So women were no longer making choices 
that differed from the white male full-time norm? And if that's so, should organizations consider incentives to encourage more employees to adopt flexible work options? Well, that, that's a really interesting question, a profound one. I can say that with respect to leave, leaves of absence, we do tend to find, say, in European organizations where men are um, almost as likely as women to go out on leave and they're encouraged to take family leave when a, a child is born, that the differential impact is less. So we think part of the, the reality is that the uptake has been historically more um, women uh, choosing to uh, uh, take these positions and the systemic effects uh, therefore affect them adversely. So to the extent we in HR are monitoring the distribution of utilization, if you will, of these arrangements and ensuring that it's not um, vastly disproportional for one group or another, I think you're less likely to have these uh, adverse uh, effects, absolutely. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, now we're also, uh, the, the uh, word of the day is AI, at least the, <laughs> of the month here. And so somebody asked, yeah. do you think the upcoming AI transformation of companies will add to the discrimination and bias experienced by women and people of color? That is, you know, the first ones to be fired would be you know, people who are already in more rote jobs, for example? Well, I know, you know, the, the greatest experience we have with this uh, is on the recruiting side. There are, there was an explosion over the last decade of uh, different recruiters using predictive uh, hiring methods, uh, applying AI, right? So they kind of match you to the success profile. Um, and there are very big risks there. Uh, because the way the evaluations are, are made, um, they're not unbiased, right? They, there are baked in differences in uh, people using technologies. For example, older workers may have less versatility and, and uh, uh, be less able to navigate the technologies that are used for these purposes. So they're systematically blocked out similarly with people of color. So uh, I, I definitely do have concerns. There's no, there's no question there are advantages to such tools if you have high volume, uh, but we need to bake in protections. And one of the ways you can do it is by understanding your success profiles, right? Because you don't want to map something to, to a, um, a structure that is already biased. If, if you're driving your hiring based on your success profile and your success profile is working to the disadvantage of certain groups, you need to repair that problem first before you start to reinforce it with hiring that will bring in, um, you know, uh, will aggravate those differentials. Right, understood. And um, uh, we, we had a number of questions all around the, uh, I think the, the disparities in performance ratings. Yeah. And uh, uh, the question was, did you also look at the gender and race of the manager performing the evaluation? Absolutely, so in all of these models, when we account for supervisor characteristics, we will account for um, all of their demographics and we'll look at the matching. Uh, this may be surprising, but we see less consistent patterns there. So I can't tell you if it's a white supervisor evaluating a black employee that that is always, a, uh, or even preponderantly associated with negative uh, outcomes. Similarly with uh, gender, it sometimes happens. Um, but sometimes happens in the reverse. You know, we'll sometimes find black supervisors are less likely to give a black employee a high performance rating. So I, I wouldn't uh, necessarily assume um, that uh, race and gender are driving those outcomes, but positioning and the performance of the supervisor, him or herself, very much so. Understood. Um, now, uh, just a question about your, your, your process, your methodology, especially when working with individual companies. How much, how much data, how many years of data is needed to really understand what's going on in the labor market of a, of a company? Well, longitudinal data is really critical here. Yeah. You know, I almost never use... Um, a point in time data and do cross-sectional analyses. 
because so much of what matters in human capital takes place over time. And if you ever want to get to causal relationships or at least intimate that you've captured a causal relationship, you need multiple points in time. Uh, three years is kind of a minimum uh, to really get a picture of what's happening from a career standpoint, five years uh, even better. We actually don't like to go much beyond, unless you were looking at long-term career trajectories and a very focused study on careers, you might want to go longer than that. But you know, the world is changing so rapidly, organizations are changing. You don't want to let ancient history over, um, uh, get, you know, dominate uh, the results you get. So three to five years is a good window. 600, 700 employees in, in a group um, is, uh, the, you know, kind of a, a threshold uh, that we need. But obviously, there's a trade off there. So the more years, the more observations, the fewer employees you need. But uh, I'd kind of say five, 600 plus three to five years is a threshold. Okay, great. And we just have about less than half a minute left. So um, I will just, uh, I, there have been a few questions asking about, uh, uh, gather that this data is U.S. based and wondering if you've done any uh, similar analyses in other countries, uh, especially Europe. Oh, yeah, no, this, this is, I think only 40% of the employees in in the 20 companies that I reviewed for this uh, for the study uh, were U.S. based. These are global organizations for the most part, and we find uh, patterns are are uh, these kind of patterns are quite similar um, wherever we are. Tend to be more uh, Europe and Asia and the U.S. Um, I haven't done as much in Latin America, um, so I don't want to speak to that. But, right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Great. Well, thank you. And that is all we have time for. Really appreciate this uh, getting us started today, Haig, with a really fantastic session and, and uh, congratulations on the research you've done. It's really powerful uh, to be able to see this and have it based on um, a really rigorous data analysis. So thank you so much. Thank for you so much, that. Elizabeth. Hi, my name is Gerald Tretavian. I'm the founder and CEO of Year Up. Uh, Year Up is a $200 million national nonprofit organization. Uh, and our mission is to uh, work with young adults in to ensure that they get access to the skills, the experiences, and the support that they need to uh, gain access to livable wage careers in higher education. Uh, we've had the fortune, good fortune to serve 40,000 young adults from 26 locations across this country and to provide them with true economic mobility. And we do that by partnering with the largest organizations in this country. We work with 60% of the Fortune 100 and provide them with a relevant, valuable, and scalable pipeline of diverse talent. Uh, we also work with those organizations through our subsidiary, Grads of Life, to help them to implement best practices uh, that lead to inclusive and equitable employment. So if you uh, have an interest in building those types of uh, talent pipelines in working with Year Up and Grads of Life, we would be honored to engage with you and appreciate the opportunity. Uh, so thank you so much and be well. Hi, I'm Ali McDonald, Senior Editor at SMR, and it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Beth Berwick. Beth is a partner at Grads of Life, a subsidiary of Europe that works with companies to build inclusive talent practices. Today, she'll be discussing the why, what, and how of skills-based talent practices. And we'll have a few minutes at the end of Beth's presentation to answer questions. With that said, welcome Beth. Thank you so much, Allie, and, and thanks to Gerald for that for that great introduction. Um, as Gerald mentioned, um, Grads of Life is a part of the broader organization Europe, and we are really focused on the employer side of the equation and see employers as the key levers for change to, the, to ensure that more people have access to good jobs. Um, and that specifically includes those without four-year degrees. Um, so we work directly with companies to implement skills-based talent practices in order to achieve this goal, goal um, which I'm excited to talk to you about today. 
So I'm sure many of you at this point have heard about skills-based employment, um, but it's really the idea of using skills rather than degrees to determine readiness for a role. It's a fast growing movement. I think it's sort of really part of the lexicon, especially in the last six months to a year um, in corporate America and beyond. And we've seen a huge number of businesses and even some states, as we see here, um, commit to hiring and promoting people based on skills rather than degrees. And, you know, this is a space that has been getting increasing momentum over the last several years. Um, we released some research in 2017 called Dismissed by Degrees um, with Harvard Business School and Accenture that really talked about this idea of degree inflation that had been occurring really were where roles that used to not require four-year degrees all of a sudden were requiring them, where at many companies you were shut out of jobs that you previously wouldn't have been just because you did not have a college degree. And this momentum that is growing is really being pushed by companies, which is great. And we've seen a lot of employer coalitions um, led by 110 um, and the Business Roundtable make bold commitments around skills-based practices that have come to dominate the national conversation a bit about HR. Um, and from where I sit, this is obviously extremely exciting. Um, and I think there's still a lot of work to do um, that we can talk a little bit about now. Businesses are moving quickly to adapt to, and figure out what does this mean? What does this mean for my company? And how do we really do this? And when we hear skills-based practices, I think many people think it's really just about removing that degree requirement. And to be clear, that is a big piece of the work. You have to take that requirement off of job descriptions and because it's excluding 64% of the population and including 76% of Black Americans and 80% of Latinos. Um, but however, this approach goes far beyond just removing the degree requirements. And there are several changes to traditional practices and policies and company culture that need to happen for skills-based efforts to succeed. So yes, you need to remove the degree requirements, but you have to determine what are the skills that are required for this job, ensure that your hiring managers are on board, how do you transform your culture to ensure that degrees don't continue to be the proxies that folks are using and, that, and also ensure that degrees aren't preventing you, not having a degree, isn't preventing you from advancing. I think taking a skills-based approach to talent acquisition and talent management is common sense in many ways. And, you know, I think many HR professionals realize you, they are using degrees as a proxy for certain skills and that digging underneath to really get at what those skills are is just good practice generally. And you can understand that people can get those skills through, you know, traditional routes such as a four-year degree or through other ways of, of, of finding those skills. So it also helps to reach many of the business objectives that companies have. I think that's important as we think about how do we how do we get the buy-in and how do we convince folks to make changes to, to how they operate? And so it, um, it creates a much more equitable and diverse workforce, as I talked about in some of the stats I used earlier. Um, it helps lower the cost of hiring and make stronger hires. It also helps to strengthen organizational culture, retention, and advancement. And in, and in the end, when lots of companies are doing this, it really creates social value. Um, communities see more economic opportunity and mobility. So it's about sort of business value and social value um, are sort of two sides of, of the coin there. As I mentioned, um, building a comprehensive skills-based organization is about much more than removing degree requirements. You will probably hear me say that throughout this, this um, talk, but you know it requires this changing uh, along the spectrum of sourcing and recruiting, of hiring, of retention and advancement. And you know, I won't read through this entire slide, but to call out a few pieces, I think, you know, in step three is, is the sourcing piece. How do you find the right talent? And if you, even if you are to remove the degree requirement from your job descriptions, if you continue to source talent in the same way as you have previously, you will continue to get the same results. So this is a this this step is really about figuring out the skills and building the partnerships with 
talent developers and other organizations that train people without degrees into the careers that you're looking for. And you need to work with them to build this robust talent pipeline. Again, you have to think differently about where you're sourcing talent and how you're assessing the skills. And there's a lot of organizations, Europe obviously being one of them, that um, that works with talent to develop those skills and can place them into roles within your organization. Um, the other the other piece I want to call out here is this step six around skills based professional development. So once you bring on skills based hires, you have to make sure that they can advance within your within their company by growing their skills. And I think around 76 percent of all workers say that they are attracted to jobs where they are able to still gain more skills. Um, so this upskilling piece is really critical and you don't want sort of an, a stagnation at an entry level workforce that doesn't have that may not have a four year degree and then has nowhere to go. So that's why it sort of goes beyond just not just beyond removing the degree requirement, but beyond hiring. So once you bring folks in, where do they go next? So if this level doesn't require a degree, but the next level up does, does that prevent folks from moving up? So we've been working with a lot of companies on, okay, we have this large frontline workforce that you know we have, think have these certain skills based on the work we do with them, but to get into these other jobs, we do require that they have a four-year degree. What do we do? How do we think about the skills that we're getting to our frontline workforce and what skills, what jobs those people can grow into in order to progress in their career? We just, we don't want it to sort of stop at that first hiring level and not think about what happens next because they're real opportunities within your workforce already where it may not require going out for sourcing. And so I think this is something that a lot of companies we are seeing work on as they realize they have this entry level workforce that they could use as a pool of talent for other jobs, but it requires identifying what skills they're getting in their job now, what skills might they need for these other jobs, and how do we get them from here to there. Um, and the last one I'll call out is um, within step seven, which is really investing in something that we call mindset shift and internal storytelling. Um, you know, skills-based hiring will lead you to a different set of, um, a different workforce than you may currently have and many non-traditional hires. So you have to make sure you invest in reducing bias and shifting mindsets to create that inclusive culture so that people stick around. Um, so internal storytelling can be a key way to do that. And there are different things that will move, motivate and move different people, which I can talk about a little bit um, in my next slide, but um, the value of skills-based hiring and telling the stories of people within your workforce can be a really, a really great place to start. So I'm going to give you guys um, a couple of examples of some companies that we have worked with that have done this. But before I do that, I want to highlight the importance of measuring the impact of these skills-based practices. So whether you are newly implementing these practices or they already exist, there are some key questions you can use as your North Star to continually assess how these efforts are helping your business and your employees. And again, to the storytelling piece that I just talked about, some people are motivated to change by data. So this having this data and tracking when I made this change, this is what happened, can be really, really powerful in making sure there's buy-in throughout the company on this work um, to ensuring that, that you're actually seeing an impact of what you're doing. Again, you have to ensure that you can, you could take the degrees off the rolls, but how are we ensuring this is actually changing our practices and we are getting the outcomes that we want through this work? Um, so, I mean, one key piece to look at is what, what percentage of your job postings do not require a four-year degree? Again, that's not the be-all, end-all, but, but tracking that is really critical. And one of the companies that we work with, that answer was 90%. They removed degree requirements from almost all of their roles. And, you know, they were in a business that they could do that, but it was, it was IT. And they kept them for sort of like legal jobs. There were a couple that like actually, you know, needed to have some advanced degree requirements, but they removed them from a lot of their roles. And I think part of that is a communication too, right? That tells the company and people within the company, like, we're going to change the way we think about hiring broadly. And that, I think, just is a great first step to, as you think about the commitment of a company to make these changes. And then, obviously, looking at how 
this changes your diversity is another critical point. A lot of um, companies have diversity goals. And so thinking about how making this change may impact the diversity of your workforce is sort of a, a critical piece of that as well. Um, so next, I will get into uh, a couple of examples. Um, so Cleveland Clinic, um, which, which many people probably know, is a world-class hospital in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and they um, joined the uh, 110 Coalition at the beginning in 2020 and wanted to really think about um, how to increase um, the diversity of their workforce and specifically thinking about um, Black employees in their workforce. Um, so they took a skills-based approach um, to retain and hire more Black employees from the Cleveland community. And so after working with grads of life, they to determine which roles to start with and where they had opportunity to shift key practices within their company, they launched two apprenticeship programs. Um, in addition to that, from the apprenticeship programs, they defined skills-based career pathways. So that's, again, I'm talking about, it's not just, you know, the hiring can't stop there. Like what's the pathway for folks that may come into their roles? And then they remove the degree requirements from over 2000 roles. Um, and as a result, they hired or promoted over a thousand black people into family sustaining wage roles. Um, and this was a huge accomplishment for the Cleveland Clinic. Um, they have historically had a challenged relationship with the community in which they work, and they name this as a critical priority. And I think very importantly, importantly to name, it was named as a critical pri priority by senior leaders and specifically by their CEO. And that I think made a huge difference on the ability to actually implement this. And again, on creating the buy-in, on how do you make sure this change happens? How do you really get people to change the way they work? And they had said at the, you know, from the top, this is something we're gonna do. This is a commitment we're gonna make. How do we make this happen? And we came in to help them do that. Um, so the next example I'm gonna give um, is sort of, is more around the culture and mindset shift that I mentioned earlier. Um, so this is around Delta, which I assume many of you know, I took a lovely flight on Delta yesterday. Um, they wanted to invest in their frontline managers, given their large frontline workforce. Um, and I think all of us have seen the data and experienced in our own careers, um, the importance of managers in the satisfaction and retention of employees. So as you think about buy-in and what do you need to do internally <laughs> once you've removed degree requirements, once you've brought people into your workforce that may have a different background than those before, how are you ensuring they stay? How are you ensuring managers know why you're doing this? They're just such a critical group um, to make sure you get buy-in from um, as part of this work. And so we work with them to, under to make sure they understood um, why, are you do why are we doing this? What's the way, the best way to manage this new talent um, that you're bringing into the workforce? So we delivered, we at Grads of Life delivered a series of trainings for Delta's managers to help them better understand, again, the why behind this. What's the, what's, what does this do? And what do I need to maybe do differently as a manager to ensure the effect effectiveness of this work? Um, so those are, that's sort of a little bit of the why, a little bit of the how, and some examples that they have. Um, and Ali, I'm happy to uh, take some questions from the group um, if anybody has any. Well, thank you so much, Beth. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, we've been getting a lot of great questions in the chat and we have a couple more minutes. So feel free folks to submit your questions for Beth. But we did have a lot of questions come up about assessment. So in terms of making this big shift from um, degree based, you know, uh, pay scales and how how are you aligning, um, you know, how are you thinking about where measurement comes in here? Is it self-assessment? Is it certific certification? Um, and how do companies sort of successfully uh, move to new assessment measures rather than just relying on, you know, degrees and kind of legacy approaches? Yeah, I mean, so that's why I think the, the first step is this 
how do we determine what skills we need and what are some partnerships that we can create where that we know we know those skills are being developed um, and then what can we do in turn what are we what are we training for internally um, and so a lot of companies that we've worked with again some of them have taken their their current workforce so maybe their frontline workforce who who may not have um, degrees and said, here's a program that we're going to do an apprenticeship program where we put you in a program where we think about like what skills do you need to get there. Um, others, they're, you know, partnerships with a variety of talent providers, with community colleges, different places. And I think, I think the key first step is to think, what are we using that degree as a proxy for? Like, what do we really need people to have and who can help us get get talent that has that training? And what are we training for internally? So it does require this sort of upfront work um, for to really define skills um, in jobs to say, okay, this is what we need. And here's who we can go partner with, or here's how we would assess whether this person has that job. Here's what we know our frontline job our workforce has because you know they work here. We know what they're developing. They're developing these great customer facing skills in retail. So what about what are other jobs within our company that would that need that? And then what are the two or three things we may need to build onto that? So, you know, it, it digging underneath the skills for the job, I think, is the important first step. And then you can figure out what's the how are we assessing for those either through partnerships or other things. But you don't want to create another assessment. That's just another barrier. That's not a degree requirement, but something else that's sort of also preventing new talent from coming in. Exactly. And so in terms of compensation to like the shift that teams and HR organizations would have to go about, are you seeing, um, you know, have you seen in some of the example companies any shifts away in terms of aligning pay scale more with skills versus years of experience or college degree? Yes, exactly. I mean, you sort of think about it for role. And if this person is, you know, good for this role, it doesn't matter that you're not paying for a degree versus skills. You know, it's just a different way to achieve the skills. So, you know, we definitely think of, you know, we think of what are good jobs, what are the, you know, family sustaining wage jobs, and how are we ensuring that no matter the pathway to get there, you get that family sustaining wage. That's great. And we had a question come in from one of the slides where you were walking through sort of different measures to take. And one was on sort of creating more equitable onboarding processes. And I'm just wondering how that is showing showing up. Creating equitable onboarding? Yes. Um, I mean, again, I think you're, what are the skills we expect somebody to come into the role with? And then what are we going to provide them through onboarding, whether you have a degree or not? And then what additional training do we think people need? And so I think, you know, again, we don't we don't want to create two classes of workforce, right? That's not the idea. I think, you know, the idea is just to think about what are different ways for people to achieve these skills? Um, and then, you know, what are we sort of adding on top of that to maybe support folks. I mean, we, we also talk a lot about sort of mentorship and sponsorship. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of reason I think the apprenticeship model is attractive to people. It's, you know, bringing people in in cohorts and providing them with real on the world experience. There are different ways that folks are thinking about, you know, onboarding talent that may be different from what they normally bring in. But, you know, I think underneath it all, like, you know, why it's this, this skills-based approach is really thinking about what are the skills we expect people to come in with? What are we providing them? And then what do we help them to get to the next level? Great. And I think we have about time for one more question. We had really great questions, but um, going back to sort of the mindset shift, leadership shifts, um, what advice do you have in terms of experience you may have had with working with other organizations in terms of overcoming resistance to this big shift? Yeah, I mean, again, I think it's how folks decide to implement it. There are some companies that we work with, like I said, where they're like, we're going to remove degree requirements from 90% of our roles. This we want to do across the, the company. I mean, Delta has said that basically, we're going to do this across the company. We need to figure out how to implement it. I think, you know, in some cases, it's, you know, piloting it in certain roles, saying this is where we're going to start. And, and many times, you know, the talent can speak for itself. And so managers can come and say, this is great, we love this program, and that can sort of build off of that original um, group that you go with. I mean, we talk about having finding internal champions, like don't start with your hardest group, right? You know, so some of it is, I think, depending on the culture of the organization, where they are, what your current workforce looks like, there's different ways to implement it. Um, but, 
you know, I think figuring out the like, what's the rollout plan for the broader? And I think depending on where you are, that could be start small and expand. It could be like, we're going to do this broadly and, and you know, and, and push it out. And um, it depends a little bit on culture and, and, and how people want to roll it out. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for this presentation and for taking some questions, Beth. I think this has been really helpful for our audience. In our next session, my colleague David will be having a conversation about the future of talent with the CEO of Brandstad, our presenting partner for this event. Appreciate it. I am uh, really excited to talk with Mike about his company and he himself are uniquely positioned to talk about some of the most important trends that are influencing the workforce today. Companies are changing their approach to designing work, supplying uh, and managing talent, measuring performance, uh, applying new technologies in new ways. Uh, love to talk to you about some of these trends that you're seeing. Uh, last time we spoke, we spoke for more than an hour. It wasn't enough time. Here, we've only got 10 minutes. We're not going to have time to take questions. Uh, what would you say some of the top trends that you're seeing are that are the most interesting, surprising, and con uh, uh, consequential hmm. today? Hmm. No problems. Yeah, 10 minutes. So I'm going to have to squeeze as much in as I can, David. So I'll try and speak fast. But um, I think one of the most innovative ones that I've seen more recently that started to take shape is this, this label that's emerging of what's called trust-based hiring. And if you think about uh, the way that recruitment typically happens within an organization, you typically have a, a talent acquisition team, an outsource team, a third-party agency that's recruiting on behalf of an organization, and they hand off that candidate internally, and then the hiring manager does the first interview. They're involved in maybe a technical assessment. They do the second interview. They work with HR and onboarding, et cetera. And this move towards trust-based hiring is the thought process of, how can we take our talent acquisition team and individual recruiters and make them absolute experts in every facet of what happens within this particular line of business and department and allow them to almost run 90% of that process without the need for the hiring manager to be as intimately involved as they were previously. Now, in these situations, typically the hiring manager is still involved in the final process, a cultural team check, et cetera. But the, the recruiter is effectively empowered to undertake all of the steps in that process, including technical, behavioral and competency style interviews that previously would have happened in a, a forum where the hiring manager did that. That requires you to be very thoughtful and intentional about upskilling your recruiters to be able to undertake those technical style assessments. They need to understand what a good answer looks like. Um, but it's resulting in three things. The talent's happier because they get through the process faster and you see increased acceptance uh, to offer ratios. The hiring manager spends more time on their core business. And uh, lastly, the recruiter's happier because they're having a more impact, uh, a more deep and profound impact on the organization. One of the interesting things that's connected to this is obviously with the plethora uh, of uh, uh, discussion points on generative AI at the moment, the democratization of intelligence around how to, how to conduct a technical interview, what good technical interview answers look like, et cetera, is accelerating and also causing questions on that. But I think it's a super interesting trend. The second one I'd say is the movement towards what's called uh, talent and HR orchestration recipes. This is the question about how do you use data, technology, process, particular, in particular, predictive analytics to bring personalization at scale in organizations to get work done faster by integrating with the existing native chat platform of most organizations. So I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. Let's imagine that I sent uh, three CVs to a hiring manager to review. Um, uh, what would now happen through HR orchestration recipes is I can say every time John Smith gets sent three CVs that he hasn't reviewed in this instance, I would like to automatically ping him via the Microsoft Teams native chat application and follow up to say, here's the hyperlinks to those CVs. If you, know, you can please review them, that'd be great. And if there's a situation in which you would like to interview them, please click here and we'll make sure that happens in your calendar. And that process is meeting the hiring manager where they are, 
And the thing that I think is really interesting about this is that's just the tip of the iceberg. You can then take that thought process and apply it to so many different ways of working, which then circumvents the need for your your uh, hiring manager or talent acquisition HR community to constantly be logging into different applications, et cetera. I think that one's got huge promise. And then the last one I think is finally, we're starting to see organizations think differently about actually how they get work done. This thought, this thought process, this talk of kind of total talent, if you will, has kind of evaded most organizations for a long time, but you genuinely authentically see organizations putting together like workforce of the future committees that are made up of lots of matrix enabled functions. And the focus is a move towards how do we get work done? Where do we get it done? Why do we get it done that way? And how do we empower the organization to think differently about how it's accessing skills and moving to a thought process of we don't really care on the vehicle of employment by which we get access to those skills. We just need to double down on the access to them. That's fantastic. Um, really appreciate that <laughs> review of the top three trends. Um, so is there any way, is there any way that uh, uh, you've got, you've got the different, uh, you, you've got the, the trust issue uh, trust-based hiring hmm. at total management. How would you say, uh, how would you say that, what, what would you characterize the relationship between total management and also the trust-based management, the trust-based uh, trust skills-based hiring? Yeah, I think it's a complex one. And I think there's only a, a few organizations that are really kind of uh, leaning into this at the moment. And previously, it was kind of siphoned off for what would consider to be kind of high volume, low skill roles. But we've got examples of very large global NMNC, Fortune 50, Fortune 100 organizations that are leaning into this in the professional and technical space. Once they got that right on the permanent side of things, they're now starting to democratize that in other areas of how they've worked. And, and truth be told, it's it's kind of it's easier to achieve in contingent, independent contractor, freelancer statement of work thought processes than it is on the permanent side. Most of them have actually tackled it on the permanent side, and they've deliberately and intentionally started there because they knew if they could get it right there, the move to the other ways of bringing it to life is easier. Um, uh, we're we're being entrusted in, when and incredible privilege of ours to be doing that for some organizations where we run the outsource managed service provider SOW contingent workforce at the moment. Um, and it's it's having incredibly positive impacts. Time to hire goes up. Cost of hire in some instances goes down. Um, uh, the agility to be able to move faster on time, cost and quality constraints. It, it, it can create serious unparalleled competitive advantage in talent acquisition. Cool. And can you speak to this this trend in skills based hiring? There seems to be some equity uh, benefits to that to that approach. Yeah, there, there are. Um, so, uh, firstly, I want to applaud the thought process of skills based hiring. I'm still not convinced, and it might be a little bit controversial, that skills based hiring is the right label for it. Um, what I what I would prefer to describe it as as a, a move away from an over indexation to degrees and experience for roles that don't necessarily require it. Um, and there, I want to be crystal clear, there are roles that absolutely do require degrees and you need to be um, making, making sure you're clear about that with your organization. But um, uh, I think organizations are doing it for a number of reasons. Firstly, it opens up uh, talent access that you didn't have before. And a lot of organizations are still critically struggling with bringing in what I would consider to be uh, disproportionate value creating talent. Um, and organizations are fighting the war for that. Secondly, um, it does allow you to be able to genuinely move the needle on your inclusion efforts. Um, so I think it, it's 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 a trend that absolutely needs to be paid attention to, and you need to lean into and explore it. I, I would uh, argue that organisations need to be more thoughtful in bringing the change management of that uh, practice within their organisation. And I'll just give you a, a small example. I was with a CEO uh, last week in Boston. We talked a little bit about their move to skills-based hiring. 
uh, and they moved away from over-credentialing and over-indexing on experience. Overnight, their application rates went up by 3x. They're a B2C organization, and as a result of that, the same people that apply for jobs are heavy users of their products and services. And as a result of that, they need to hire significantly more recruiters to make sure that the talent experience was consistent with the brand experience that they wanted. Now, a move in the right direction that had uh, unfortunate or unforeseen circumstances in their need to invest in making sure that they didn't impact their brand. So a, a move in the right direction, you need to be thoughtful about the change management. It can help you access talent and get to a stage where you, you bring in what I would call greater ability to meet your inclusion initiatives, but it's a heavy lift. I love that example. We've got about a minute and 18 seconds left. Uh, last, potentially the last question. Uh, dozens, if not hundreds of articles are touting the, are advocating for HR to take on a more strategic role in the enterprise. Um, but can HR take a truly strategic role if their main purview is, or exclusive purview, are employees and not external contributors. What's your view on that? Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I think in in, uh, in the organizations that uh, we work with, HR have already stepped up to the plate in, a, in an enormous way in the last 24, 36 months. So it's important uh, that I think I make that point. Secondly, uh, there is a much broader opportunity for HR to take what I would consider to be the people-centric first approach in the way that they work at the moment and apply that to the many other domains of the way that uh, work happens within an organisation or the externalities that you reference. Um, one of those, I think, is um, you're starting to see a trend of HR getting way more involved in operating and uh, managing external workforces. One quick example. Uh, CHRO for a very large logistics company, one of the largest in the world more recently said, we have 40% external workforce. Um, uh, and we are, we are gonna make sure that we democratize our learning and development content, not only for our own individuals, but for also our external third party, because our customers don't care whether they're externalities or whether they're part of our organization. We, we believe that that's the right thing to do for the people and then therefore the right thing to do for our customers. So I think that they've stepped up to the plate they got to take the next step, and I think it's it's there and ready for them to be uh, to take that step. Thank you so much, Mike. This has been such such a fun conversation. Wish we could go on. We will go on. I think at uh, uh, at another point. I hope. Uh, so thank you again. I'm going to turn this over to Abby, and thank you so much. Pleasure. Great. Thank you, Mike. And and that was a great short session. Uh, really appreciate you being here. Just to tee up our next session, um, I, I came across a headline in Forbes a couple of weeks ago that struck me, um, really got to the heart of what we're going to be talking about today. And, and the headline was, why do bosses try to get workers back to the office? They don't know how to build a culture of remote collaboration. Now, I'd add that many also don't know how to manage employees' work based on outcomes versus the proverbial bums in seats. The good news is, that it is possible to have a high-performing, healthy workplace culture in a hybrid workplace. It just needs to be managed differently. That's what we'll talk about in this session. We'll start with some brief insights from each of our three panelists. Then we'll shift to conversation, including taking questions from you in the audience. Joining us for this session are Brian Elliott, Executive Leader of Future Forum, Sharon Hill, Associate Professor of Management at George Washington University, and Julie Durbin, Global Head of Talent at Atlassian. And we'll hear from them in that order, starting with Brian. So welcome, Brian. Thanks so much, Abby, and glad to be here. I'm Brian Elliott. Uh, I've spent the last three years uh, building and leading Future Forum, a group that's been working with executives at a wide range of companies on how to make hybrid work work. Uh, we do two things. We engage directly with executives on the challenges they're facing. And we also do research, a Future Forum Pulse, which is our survey of 10,000 knowledge workers around the globe that we've run almost every quarter for the past three years, which is the results of which I'm going to be sharing with you today. This tug of war that we're seeing out there about, you know, are we going back to the way that things used to work is in part a little bit of leadership nostalgia, as Taryn Brim on my ter team termed it. It's a desire by people who... Um, uh, maybe a little bit different than the average uh, worker in their uh, in their workforce who are at the executive suite thinking about what worked for them and wanting to go back to, it, to that way of working. When we poll executives, though, we also ask them what's really driving 
uh, these uh, challenges. And the three things they cite the most often are productivity, culture, and connection. So let's start off with productivity and really what we mean by flexibility in the first place. When we polled these 10,000 knowledge workers around the globe, the results in terms of their desire for flexibility hasn't changed much in, in the past couple of years. 81% of knowledge workers, desk workers, want workplace flexibility from a location standpoint. But what we can see in the graph is the vast majority of those people do not wanna be fully remote. It's about 15% that wanna be at that extreme. What most people want is regular time in sync with their teams. For most workers, that averages out to about one to two days a week uh, together. When you give people that flexibility, when you allow them that flexibility, on average, their productivity scores are 8% higher than those that don't have flexibility. That 8% translates to about three hours a week uh, on a 40 hour work week, which is about the time that you save on the commute, not a big surprise. The bigger deal and the thing that we don't talk about enough is that time matters more than place. Getting control over nine to five calendars book full of meetings or turning your calendar into Swiss cheese so you can't find two hour blocks of time to get work done during the workday is a real challenge. 93% of workers want some form of flexibility in when they work. They want to control over that calendar so that it's not nine to five on a repeated basis, but they also want regular hours in sync with their team. If you can find a way to do that, if you can find a way to get control over that meetings driven culture, you get real benefits, 39% higher productivity scores for those that have uh, those limits in place versus those that don't. When we pulled executives, almost half of them said that they could, or executives said they could reduce almost half of their meetings with little to no discernible impact on their organization. If you can cut out half your meetings, you can kind of understand why there might be some productivity gains. So productivity benefits from flexibility. From a culture and connection standpoint, there's a lot of mythology out there, I think in part driven by, again, this leadership nostalgia issue, because a lot of executives grew up understanding that culture was the slogans on the wall and the all hands that they did in, in a company's, in an organization. But when we pull workers and we ask them whether or not their company's culture has improved over the past couple of years, the number one driver of corporate culture improvement is providing people more flexibility. If people were provided flexibility over the past couple of years, they're 57% more likely to say that their company's culture has improved. These same people that have flexibility also say that they feel more connected to their direct manager, to their executive leader, to their company's values. Now, this isn't just a mistake. It's also partly driven by demographics. We now have two generations of digital natives in the workforce. There's something more fundamental, I believe, underneath this, which is the factor of trust. If you are saying to people, I'm going to give you the flexibility because I expect to measure you based on the outcomes that you produce, and I'm going to be the flexibility to create those outcomes, you're saying that you trust them. And that builds culture and it builds connection. One other really important factor that ties back to what, if you listen to what Haig was saying earlier on during the day, is the difference that comes across uh, race, ethnicity, and gender in a lot of our results. Working moms, 59% of working moms want to work from the office two days a week or less. This compares to 47% of working fathers. It's a really big deal, especially in the US and the UK where we're facing a childcare crisis. When we look across race and ethnicity, what we've seen over the past couple of years is this consistent trend that sense of belonging has actually improved for black and for Hispanic Latinx knowledge workers, more so than their white and Asian American colleagues. Those same groups also express a greater desire for workplace flexibility. The challenge underneath all of this is that if we fall back into presenteeism, what we're then doing is proximity bias. If we're rewarding people on the basis of who shows up early and who stays late, as opposed to who builds outcomes, we want run real risks that instead of building more inclusive organizations, we actually make things potentially worse. So if you're an executive that's wrestling with all this and seeing all this data, but also feeling like, you know, I've tried the top down mandate and it's not really working, but I also can't go the full route of employee freedom and choice because then that becomes a free for all. How do you find that framework? How do we meet in the middle? Um, we spent a lot of time building up content around this. We have a book ha called How the Future Works. But think about how you build out principles, not policies, and develop guardrails. What are the extremes that any one team can have of how frequently they get together, for example, or how you use time? Instead of centering those conversations at the top and saying three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday are the right days to be in the office, most organizations, there's no one size fits all that's going to work. Think about how you build team level agreements. 
And last thing that I'll leave you with that's probably the most essential is instead of thinking about basing our promotions and our outcomes on attendance and who shows up and productivity stats, outcomes, the actual generation of positive results is what we really ought to be training our managers on how to lead towards. That's how you build a more level playing field and that's how you get the most out of flexibility. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Sharon Hill. Welcome, Sharon. Thanks so much, Brian. My name's Sharon Hill. I'm an Associate Professor of Management at the George Washington University. And I've been studying and teaching uh, virtual and remote work for about a couple of decades now. And in many ways, I'm gonna uh, build on a lot of the themes that Brian mentioned and talk about a phenomenon that we're seeing right now, where coming out of the pandemic, many organizations really fully embrace this flexible work uh, arrangements. And in many respects, it was in response to employees' demand for flexibility, a lot of what Brian spoke about. But then within a year or so, we see some corrections going on, the pendulum swinging the other way with many organizations bringing their, uh, implementing these mandates to bring workers back into the office. And sometimes three days a week, four days a week, sometimes uh, fully in office presence. And you get the sense that employees in, in many cases believe that this an overcorrection has occurred and that they're being robbed of some of the flexibility that they desire. But on the other hand, we also see organizations that are fully embracing the uh, this remote way of working and really doubling down and saying, yes, this is the uh, work arrangement we're gonna embrace moving forward. And so you get the sense that there's a real struggle right now in many businesses and organization to say, what is that equilibrium point? What is that right work configuration that's truly sustainable into the future? And so in a recent article in uh, MIT Sloan Management Review, I talk about this issue and really suggest the need for intentionality around considering what is the best work configuration. And one that takes into account employees' needs for flexibility, but also the strategic goals of the organization. And really what that means is being intentional about considering the actual work that's being done and what is the need for in-office presence. And if you do that, it's entirely possible that in some organizations uh, that you'll have different configurations, work configurations between organizations and quite frankly, between different groups within the same organization. And what we're looking to do is avoid these blanket policies that are often driven by maybe unconscious preferences that leaders have about the best way to work. So at the leadership level, then, what does this mean? And again, this reinforces several of the points that Brian made. It means that leaders really need to strike this balance and manage this tension, or at least it can sometimes be perceived as a tension, but it need not be between granting employees the autonomy in terms of where and when to work and even how to do their work so that they can fully embrace the flexibility that's available. But on the other hand, making sure that there's alignment between these autonomous actions. And so how do you get alignment? Well, uh, by having a very clear shared mission, by making sure employees understand how their work aligns with that mission, and then by judging them, as Brian said, on the outcomes and the extent to which they're accomplishing those goals rather than where they're actually sitting when they do their work. And something that we really need to talk about is the importance of trust and having a strong foundation of trust, because that's the only way leaders are really going to feel comfortable giving up some control. And so hopefully we can talk about trust a little bit more uh, a bit later. So with that, let me go ahead and hand over to Julie Durbin. I am the global head of talent for Atlassian. And at Atlassian, uh, we develop software that is intended to help teams collaborate. And we bring expertise to our customers to uh, help them unleash the full potential of their teams. And so as an organization, we have grown exponentially over the past few years. And today we have over 11,000 employees in 13 different countries. 
And our workforce is comprised of mostly knowledge workers, uh, majority in our R&D and software engineering. And, uh, you know, for me personally, I'm fairly new to Atlassian. Uh, I joined the company 10 months ago, and uh, I'm one of those individuals that Brian referenced uh, around growing up in a different time and a different work model in my profession and creating this mental model of what what work, uh, how we get work done. Right. And so today, a lot of those ways are uh, thought of as more conventional in this hybrid working model, in this uh, distributed working model. And so making that shift for me, I've been immersed in this organization that has made a real intentional uh, decision to adopt a digital first workforce. And so we have nearly 50% of our workforce that lives more than two hours from any physical office hub. An interesting stat is that even though half of our workforce uh, is uh, at a distance from our hubs, about 75% of our employees in any given quarter make a visit to our office. So even though the desirability around flexibility and remote and distributed workforce is there. There still is that desire to have a place to come back and to meet with with colleagues uh, in a physical setting. And so as Atlassian, uh, in making this decision, we realized that if we were going to truly capitalize on what this type of model can bring to bear, we needed to do more than just declare uh, it as a workforce model and then maybe just figure out some of the HR uh, processes around being remote or hybrid and, and give our employees some additional tools. We knew that if we were truly going to get the value of what a distributed model or a distributed first model could bring us, uh, that we had to make an investment. And you heard from Sharon and Brian words like connection, words like intentionality. And these are very important to the strategy that we have in making this model work. We have a, we've invested in a team called Team Anywhere, and their purpose is to uncover best practices in ways of working in a distributed model. They create tools that help teams and managers learn the skills and the plays to work and engage their teams and to be effective in this type of model. Um, we also... Um, you know, work with my team works with this team to take the learnings and the insights that they bring to bear for the organization and integrate those into the talent programs and solutions that my team is responsible. And so it's a real intentional way of working. And as you can see here on the slide, um, you know, these are some of the principles here that talent is everywhere and we want and we want to get the value from that a flexible employee experience and reimagining teamwork. And so some of my personal learnings um, have been what I thought I knew about remote working and effective remote working. Um, I didn't really know much once I joined Atlassian and and, and assimilating to the way that we work. Um, So what I mean by some of this is uh, we're very intentional about when we build teams and when we put project teams together around time zone compatibility. And so if we want to set our teams up for success, frankly, there are certain time zones that if we have key individuals in, that the degree of overlap in that time zone is very small. So it makes it very hard to connect in a live synchronous way and get work done. In addition, we are very careful around work-life balance, right? We don't want people working, um, you know, early in the morning all the way till late at night so that we can have that overlap time. So time zone compatibility, taking that into consideration when forming project teams and actually building teams is really important. Um, Another work practice and, and rhythm is being very intentional about how we get work done asynchrony asynchronously, and then when we get work done uh, in live synchronous ways. We do a lot of work that, uh, and we use our own tools, our Confluence tools, 
to collaborate on documents, to you know, collaborate on project plans. And we can do this work asynchronous, asynchronously, where we are, the time zone that we're in, and we can actually use that time zone uh, to our benefit, where we can have teams that are getting the work done to a certain degree and then passing it over to our colleagues, say, for example, in Australia, that can pick it up and keep it moving forward. And a third way is what we call intentional togetherness. And this was something that really um, uh, was new for me. So, you know, I came up in the era that if we're going to bring people together uh, in offsites, that there better be a real business purpose as to why we are making that investment. And here at Atlassian, because we are distributed first, we encourage bringing teams together, maybe on a quarterly, maybe twice a year. And the primary focus is building relationship and building trust. The business piece is secondary because we know that we're getting the business done when we're back in our place of work. Um, but we also know that to get work done in a distributed environment, we have to have the relationships and we have to have the trust. Um, and that's how we use our intentional togetherness uh, sessions. So uh, just some of the ways that we bring this to life and uh, are real intentional about how we make this work. And with that, Abby, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you, Julie and Brian and Sharon. Um, I was going to run a little poll, but in the interest of time, I think we'll just jump right into our discussion. So if you want to come back on. Um, I thought it was really interesting that sort of the, 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 the trust kept coming up in, in all of your remarks and, and the issue of coordination and managing to outcomes. So, so my first question, Brian, is for you. Coordination is more challenging when people have the flexibility to decide when and where they work. So do you have just some good practices, tips to coordinate work without bogging people down in endless meetings and video calls? Yeah, oddly enough, the biggest problem that I hear from people is one that's continued on for the past year and a half, which is, what day of the week should I show up? You know, if the average if the average is most people want to come in one to two days a week, uh, figuring that out at the team level is actually really important. Mm -hmm. and there's ways in which managers can kind of just set standards. So, for example, I see this in a lot of sales teams in particular, where they'll say, "Look, uh, Wednesday is the one day of the week we want everybody in the office." for everybody who is geographically co-located, and then pick a day, Tuesday or Thursday, for your sub-teams uh, to be in. And on those days, don't pack them full of meetings, because if you're then packing them full of meetings, all people are doing is hopping in and out of Zoom calls, which they could have done you know, from home. So best thing to do is to sit there and say, from a, we're going to let teams figure this out, but we're going to give them guidelines for doing it. We'll also give them tools for doing it, preferably. And there are tools out there that can help with this. But it's also important to put guardrails in place. And I think a couple of those that are really critical are things like we set up uh, executive speed limits uh, when I did this with the executive team at Slack. The leadership team won't come in more than three days a week because if the leadership team is all showing up five days a week in the C-suite, uh, what they're really saying is we expect you to be back. But we also don't want, there, there's a phrase we used, digital first doesn't mean never in person. It is really important that you get teams together on at least a once a quarter basis so even if they're spread out across three different time zones, funding the travel to bring those people together for a three-day gathering where they're spending their time on socialization, team building, and bonding is a really essential ingredient. So guardrails around it and then team level agreements are the best practices that we've seen in use. Great. And yeah, that was something that Julie talked about as well. So Sharon, um, trust building is critical in the collaborative work environment that that came up again and again. So how do you do that when teams are so dispersed? What are some what are some things that you've seen work to build trust when teams are not together all the time? Certainly. Uh, so Absolutely, trust is critical in distributed and virtual work environment. And we talk a lot about social connection and Brian has mentioned that and Julie has mentioned that. And that's certainly one important way in, tr in which trust builds and we cannot ignore that. But I think what's often overlooked is that we can do a lot to build trust even when team members are dispersed and distributed. And so one, an additional way in which trust builds, which is not 
so related to social connection is just how we interact with each other around getting the task done. And so when I'm responsive to you, when I meet my commitments, when I essentially act in ways that signal I care about the collective interest, I am actually signaling that I'm trustworthy and helping to build trust within the group. And so one of the things I think is really important is not just focusing on the social connection piece, which I can't underestimate the importance of that, but also thinking about what are the norms that you as a leader are setting and reinforcing within your work group around responsiveness, accountability, and other ways in which we are going to communicate that help to build trust even when we're not together. And I think that's very important also. Right, and very similar to, to Brian's team level agreements. Mm -hmm. Julie, um, we've, we've talked about, and we, we've all mentioned this and, and we know it's so important today to manage two outcomes. Um, but it's not easy, that's not an easy thing to do. So what do people managers need to know or do differently to be successful there? Yeah, great question. And that, that role that that manager plays in this type of a model is so critical. Um, and they're critical in the onboarding process. They're critical in facilitating connections uh, across the team, across the organization. And um, they're very critical in making sure that they are bringing clarity, that they are helping to be the translators of the priorities of the organization and what that means to the teams, and then working with the teams to clarify how does that team contribute to the overall strategy and making sure that it's not just left at, you know, here's some conceptual areas that we're going to go after. It's, it's spending the time up front and doing the hard work of driving to clarity around goals and expectations. Because when our teams have that clarity, then they are empowered to run. And uh, so that role of the manager is absolutely critical and the setting goals and the clarity is paramount. So we've got some really great questions coming from the audience. So I want to just um, pull in a few of those right now. And and th this one is directed at you, Brian, but I think, you know, if any of you have research or insight into this question, that would be great. So one attendee noted that his company adopted a hybrid model, but found that people with fewer than two years with the company were leaving at a 70% higher rate than others with longer tenures who would have had more in-person experiences pre-pandemic. Are you seeing any indication or similar retention challenges for newer employees in your data? Uh, we don't see it necessarily in the data. A couple of questions that, that brings to mind and others ought to chime in here too. One is, was that true also pre-pandemic? Because turnover in most organizations happens in mm -hmm. the first you know, year and a half of employment. So it's kind of a bit of a truism. If you're seeing that recently, it probably also was there back in 2019, 2018, and 2017. So you might want to take a look at that. The second is, we are seeing a world in which, um, you know, there is greater turnover and has been greater turnover. That's slowing down as the economy tightens back up again, too. But I do think one of the things that we need to pay a lot more attention to is how we think about onboarding employees effectively, especially younger employees, into organizations and the role of not only managers, but mentors uh, in building those mm -hmm. relationships and getting people acclimated into an organization. Yeah. Yes. Sharon, are you seeing anything um, with your data? Yeah, so I think related to this, related also to this question, um, building on some of the points that Brian made is, again, those who have been with the organization for a longer period of time before transitioning to a hybrid mode have built up that basis of credibility, that base of connection with the organization. And so I think one of the things that we need to think about for those joining who they don't have that history and they don't have that, um, that goodwill already built up is what are we doing to intentionally bring them in? And we, we've heard about presenteeism and proximity bias and it's easy for people to get left out. So I think particularly with those who are new to the organization, it takes more, again, intentionality to make sure that we're bringing them in because they don't have that pre-existing basis of connection mm. with the organization. 
And Julie, kind of related to that, um, there are a couple of questions for you. One is, um, can you describe more about your intentional togetherness sessions? What do those look like? What kinds of activities do you have there? And then also for newer team members, what are you doing for them so that they can learn informally from others to realize their potential? Mm -hmm. Great question. So I had the benefit of when I uh, joined Atlassian last September, three weeks later, we had an, an entire team intentional togetherness uh, session where we brought uh, the individuals on my team together from all around the globe. And I think it was for the first time since the pandemic. So, um, and, you know, I thought, well, how's this going to go? And I'll tell you, it was a combination of um, you know, we came together in one location, combination of a, uh, you know, team effectiveness, chili cook off, uh, using some of our manager plays that we have created and building actual team effectiveness, using some team assessments, having dialogue, learning how each other likes to work, learning about our personalities, and then, um, you know, and then just enjoying each other's company. And, you know, these are individuals that have worked together for two and three years. And this was the first time that they had seen each other live. So, um, uh, so that's, you know, what, what we do with our intentional togetherness. Um, and as far as new joiners, uh, one of the programs my team is responsible for is onboarding new Atlassians. And um, we have, we use a lot of data to really understand that new hire journey and understanding it in the distributed workforce model. And one of the leading predictors of new joiners being able to get things done fast um, and kind of time to impact is building connections early on in the, early, in the onboarding process. I don't want to. I don't want to get into the like policy one day, two day, three day questions. But um, can you can can you? And this this question is actually addressed to all of you. So, how can you avoid inequity between those who hold to the hybrid model and those who choose to be in the office more frequently? What what kinds of things should organizations be doing there? I mean, I'll, I'll chime in a little bit with. Um... In our survey work, there actually is a substantial portion of the population that needs the office space, right? There are people that for whom home is not a suitable setup. Um, there are people who need that separation between work and home. It's about 20% of folks that actually want five days a week. So you got to be careful not to find them uh, being pigeonholed into um, into a space you don't want them in. Regardless of like location, this basically comes back to what Julie was describing also and Sharon too, which is ma managing the outcomes. And you know, how do you think about the ways in which you actually ladder that up and down within an organization? Uh, Google's probably the most famous purveyor of OKRs, objectives, and key results as a methodology. Salesforce has this thing called the V2 Mom. It's these are basically different methodologies by which you sit there and say, what are the most important five things in an organization? What are the ways in which we're going to measure those key results? And how does that ladder up and down uh, your organization? so that you can bring that down to the team level. Finding some way to do that is your is your best bet for um, uh, leveling that playing field. And then the other thing to think about is making sure that not only when you're thinking about promotions, but when you're thinking about rewarding people with new opportunities, when you're thinking about the next job, when you're thinking about the cool project, looking at the scope of the team broadly and saying who's had those opportunities and who has not as a way of making sure that you're making conscious decisions. So I, I would build on that, just a, a couple of points to build on that. And and again, I think Brian said making conscious decisions. And I think it starts with understanding that this is an unconscious bias that happens where we unconsciously just pay more attention, give more feedback to, and focus more on things and people who are proximal to us. So once we realize that and we bring that to awareness, we can then take very conscious steps to say very intentionally, you know, Am I connecting with people who are remote as much as I am in the office? Am I bringing them into the decision making in meetings? Am I giving those who are remote equal opportunity to participate? So I think it starts with an awareness that this is happening at an unconscious level and then being very intentional about it. The only other thing that I would add is we've got to be careful also that this isn't differentially impacting different groups of employee. And so what I've seen and some of my research shows is that, for example, women may be stigmatized more for working remotely and choosing to stay out of the office. And so I think that's the other thing we need to do, make sure we're being inclusive for all employee groups. 
So the question, the question is, what about the dark side of flexibility? How do managers tackle performance challenges that might stem from new levels of flexibility without penalizing those who are ma maintaining performance? Um, there's sort of an assumption built into that question, but uh, how it goes back to the outcomes, um, the topic of outcomes, managing to outcomes. So do you want to address that or, and um, to tie it back to the previous, previous discussion, um, does it matter if the manager is someone who is spending a lot of time working remotely or being in the office a lot? I can I can kick it off, um, you know, just based on experience um, here at Atlassian, it comes back to uh, the role of the manager and getting really clear on expectations and managing by objective um, and helping our managers build the skills to create the conditions that employees can be successful in a distributed work environment or remote work environment. The other piece about um, performance and um, and it goes back to the previous question as well is that um, that topic of trust as a manager when you focus on building trust in your teams then if you do have individuals in different time zones that are fully remote and not close to an office you have that built-in trust to know that hey if there's two other employees on my team that are in the office and can get something done faster um, than asynchronously working and waiting for me to come online in my time zone, I'm going to trust that they're going to get that piece done. Um, and then we're going to come back together when it makes sense. And so that trust piece and being able to leverage actually people that are together in offices and not look at it as a barrier or, you know, a deficit. We've really underserved managers uh, consistently for decades. You know, frontline managers in our research show up as the most burned out almost every time we run one of these surveys. They're more burned out than executives. They're more burned out than their teams. The burden of both their individual contributor load that they often still carry, as well as just being not be well trained in what it means to be a manager and leader, because you're often taking the most senior experienced person in the group and saying, congratulations, you're the manager. Good luck with it. Um, Every executive, every team that I talk with, this is where things fall apart. And so thinking about what are the tactical things you can do to help them? How do you train them on simple things like what to do with their weekly one-on-one -on -one with their employees where you talk consistently about three things? Um, what did you do last week and how did it go? What are your priorities for this week? And what can I do to help unblock you? Like just being able to do that every single week to start building rhythms and patterns is important. And the other one from a managerial perspective is helping them build networks. That is one of the challenges with distributed teams is the more that we can invest time intentionally in helping those managers build networks of other managers that they can go to for support for us as a sounding board when they're running into a performance problem with somebody so they don't feel like they have to go to the people team every time for doing that um, is pretty critical. Fantastic. Um, really great advice. And I'm sorry we're out of time. But thank you so much, Julie, Sheridan, Brian, for this really interesting conversation. Here's a short message from our sponsor. In our 2023 Talent Trends research, 82% report talent acquisition is changing, and they're now expected to think about mobility, development, career pathways, and skilling in addition to recruitment. Are you ready to develop an enterprise talent blueprint that will create business advantage from today's market uncertainty, guide people to achieve their true potential, and deliver more meaningful, mission-driven work experience across the total talent lifecycle? Download your copy of the 2023 Talent Trends Report for this year's Top 10 Trends. In our next session, I'll be talking with Martin Seligman and Gabriella Rosen-Kellerman, whose new book, Tomorrow Mind, explores what it takes to thrive in the increasingly stressful world of work. Marty is the Zellerbach Family Professor of Psychology and Director of the Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania, where he focuses on positive psychology, learned helplessness, prospection, optimism, and positive education. He is a best-selling author of 30 books, including Flourish and 350 journal articles. He's a past president of the American Psychological Association and has received numerous awards recognizing the enormous impact he's had on his field, including in 21, he was named the most influential psychologist in the world by academic influence. His mission is the attempt to transform social science to work on the best things in life, strengths, positive emotion, 
Good Relationships, Meaning, and Human Flourishing. Gabriella Rosen Kellerman is an author, entrepreneur, startup executive, and Harvard trained physician with expertise in behavioral and organizational change, digital health, wealth being, and AI. She has served as Chief Product Officer and Chief Innovation Officer at BetterUp and as head of its research arm, BetterUp Labs, which is partnered with labs at Harvard, the University of Pennsylvania, Stanford, and others. Gabriella has worked on global mental health policy and interventions for the World Health Organization. Welcome, Gabriella, and welcome, Marty. Thank you so much for being with us today. Really appreciate it. Um, I, uh, oh, I have a copy of your fabulous new book. <laughs> it's an advanced copy. I'm sure the one on one in bookstores looks a little fancier and probably has a hardback, but um, really great read. Um, we had a, a wonderful article from you both in our last issue as well, talking about some of the work. Um, it was really helpful. Um, so I, I'd like to begin by asking what brought the two of you together as researchers and what prompted you to write the book? Sure. Thanks for having us, Elizabeth. Um, I will uh, maybe take the first pass and then hand it to you, Marty. So we came together in 2017. At the time, um, the CEO of BetterUp, Alexi Robichaux, had asked me to start BetterUp Labs, which you can think of as kind of like a Bell Labs for the world of work, uh, for the world of thriving at work. Um, and in that effort, positive psychology was a, a major influence because it's all about how can we take a, a rigorous scientific approach to performing better, living better, optimizing our potential. Um, and Marty, as the father of that field, was someone that was, you know, I, I was um, determined to work with. And so we, we reached out to Marty and set about uh, defining a research trajectory. Um, and, and now, you know, more than six years into that partnership, we've accomplished so much by way of data collection, analysis, partnerships with labs around the world to really define these sort of future of work skills, define how do we build them, what are the organizational, professional, personal outcomes when we do that we felt like it was time to put it all in a book. And, and that's really where Tomorrow Mind came from. Marty, anything you would add? Yes. <laughs> what, what inspired me to do the book with Gabriella were two major studies on who fails at work and who succeeds at work that I had done with United States Army. So starting in uh, 2009, uh, we followed the entire United States Army asking two questions. One, could we predict PTSD, the collapse at work? And two, could we predict exemplary work and heroism? And what we found led to the book for me in many ways. First, for failing at work, on day one, um, all soldiers take a set of psychological questionnaires that we had developed. And uh, we asked the question from day one to all 77,000 soldiers who were deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan, could we predict PTSD? And the answer was robust, yes. 5% of the soldiers deployed were diagnosed with PTSD. And the factor that predicted it was extreme pessimism, being a catastrophizer believing that when bad events occur, everything will fall apart. So number one, we could predict extreme failure at work. But number two was even more important and uh, uh, surprising for this audience. Uh, for all 990,000 soldiers uh, followed for five years, we asked, could we predict from day one who would win it? Exemplary work at heroism medals. 12% uh, of the force does. Uh, the uh, description of work, by the way, is very similar to the uh, cross section of work in America. Uh, three things predicted. First, high positive emotion at day one. Second, low negative emotion, not being a complainer. And third, high optimism. So it was those two but authoritative findings uh, that uh, inspired me to work with Dr. Ross to flesh out notions like success and failure and resilience. 
Okay, thank you. Um, now, uh, Marty, you've especially had a, a long, uh, you, you've been in, in this field for a long time. You've got a, a, a broader historical perspective, I think. Um, do you think we're seeing a, uh, a, a shift in management attitudes and are, are senior leaders placing a higher priority on employee well-being now than they have in the past? And uh, Well, I, uh, I think the generalization that we're seeing now is um, if your company is hemorrhaging, if you're in trouble, then the performance management of the past is okay. But if you're concerned with growth, then there is a new set of management tools that predicts growth. And these come from positive psychology. And this indeed is what our book Tomorrow Mind is about. Right, right. Elizabeth, if I could uh, briefly Please. chime in on that in, in terms of maybe even just the last three to four years. So I think during COVID, we got a lot of requests to talk about employee well-being. There was uh, an urgency around it. Um, and uh, of course, we're hoping that that mentality would be here to stay. Flash forward to 2023, tough economic times, lots of layoffs happening. Yeah. And there's certainly been a reversion to thinking uh, in, in older ways. Um, you know, in, in some companies, the word well-being is even now something of a four-letter word <laughs> from what we've been told. And, and it's it's actually something that is seen as a privilege versus what the company wants to be focusing on, which is performance. And mm. our strong message and the message of all of these authoritative studies of millions of people at this point is that well-being is the underpinning of performance. If yeah. you don't like the word, you don't have to use the word. You can talk about readiness, you can talk about sustainability, but without well-being, you will not have performance. And so you ignore it at your peril, uh, you silence it at your peril, you know, and, and it part of what we're really calling for is an integration of the thinking about performance with the thinking about well-being, because it's all one brain, it's all one employee, it, it all has to come together um, in in service of, of really thriving in this very unusual world of work that we're in. Right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, one of the things I found really fascinating about your book was uh, in the opening where you're re really reviewing the sort of history of uh, the human experience with work and really how we have been adjusting to work that isn't quite designed for the way we're built, uh, the way we've evolved, um, you know, for, for, for many thousands of years. So what is it about the modern work context that causes such an unprecedented degree of psychological stress? And happy to open that, but whichever one of you would like to jump in on that. Um, I can jump in first. You know, in our book, we talk about the pace of change and the nature of change as being kind of the two defining features of the world of work. So the pace of change we, we know is faster than in previous labor transformations. Um, it, uh, it, it's coming faster and faster every day. I think all the developments with GPT-3, 4, et cetera, just yeah. this year have been a reminder of the way that technology is really fueling that pace of change. It's also the global nature of change that fuels it because one change begets a million changes that then ripple back. And so it, it's, it's this feedback cycle that's unlike anything we've seen. And then the nature of change is it's complex, it's wicked problems, nested problems where there's not really a solution. And as soon as you introduce a solution, it changes the entire problem space. That is what we often talk about colloquially as living with uncertainty. It's not just that the change is fast, it's that we, we can't really see into all of the different repercussions. And so how do we still live with agency in this time? How do we not feel victimized by change? How do we feel, you know, when we're handed down decisions in a corporate environment, like we still have a, a role to play as thinking, feeling human beings, that it's all this set of concentric problems that comes about as a, as a result of that. And I think the, the overlay on that that's important to point out is the loneliness component, um, because we are so isolated in the way that we work and we know that social connection is so essential for our well-being. The Surgeon General just put out an advisory about loneliness. Um, it's it's real. It's true. It's really bad for our, our health and well-being. And at the same time, our, the type of work we're doing, which is innovative, 
Um, increasingly where we have humans involved, there's also customer service at stake. And so there's that the relational piece of it on innovation, it's collaborative. So, so much of, of the work that humans are called on to do is interpersonal in some way. Um, and you contrast that with this increasing loneliness and, and isolation. And, you know, we have the, the makings of, of a problem space here that we also try to address in the book. These, these three forms of turbulence all point to how central the notion of resilience is to success at work. And one of the crucial things about the book Tomorrow Mind, it identifies five drivers of resilience. Perhaps the, the two of you can, can walk us through, a little interested to know how you derive these, but also um, how they play out and why they're important. I'll, uh, I'll, we can do a duet here, Marty. I'll, I can start. Um, so we derive these skills from uh, a few different key data sets. So one is um, the data set of BetterUp, which is hundreds of thousands of people and millions of coaching sessions across industries. We have outcomes data attached to that. So we see what are people working on? What are their strengths coming in? How are they developing? And then what are the outcomes they see individually, um, professionally, and then at the organizational level? Um, overlaying that with the inputs from uh, the broader set of, of think tanks about the ways skills of work of, are changing and evolving and projections on what's going to expire and, and what's going to spike in the coming decades. And then simply the work of partnering with hundreds of large corporations in the Fortune 1000, small, medium businesses as well to really hear and listen to corporate leaders about what's happening. So all of that together um, led to, to these five skills. Um, I can start with prospection maybe, and then I, I, there's, I mean, there's no better person in the world to talk about resilience and prospection in particular but, uh, than Marty, but let me, uh, let me start with prospection, hand it to you for resilience, Marty. So prospection is our ability to imagine and plan for the future a uniquely human capability. It's not about predicting the future. It's more about um, foreseeing probabilistically an array of possibilities and then positioning ourselves in an agile manner, a ready manner against what uh, our collaborator Roy Baumeister calls the matrix of maybe. Um, in an era of constant and uncertain change, this is how we restore agency at the individual level, at the team level, at the organizational level. Uh, and it is in some ways the, the, met, the meta skill for our era. Great. And Marty, I'm gonna just advance the slide one because I know we have one on resilience and you have that up while you talk about that. Hey, uh, let me start and then give it to Gabriella. Okay. I've worked on resilience my entire uh, 60 years uh, in psychology. And it started by the discovery of learned helplessness. And we asked the question, who never becomes helpless? And what we found was that those people who are invulnerable, who are resilient, were the optimists. And that's what led to the research with the army. And that's what leads to asking the nuanced question at work, what are the five drivers of resilience? And so this, what you're looking at here is a regression analysis where we looked at resilience as an outcome for individuals and leaders and organizations that who responds resiliently, what are the psychological drivers that help them do that? And so you see there are many, the whole list on the left-hand side, but there's five that jump out as the biggest drivers. And these are the ones that we emphasize in coaching. Um, some of these drivers, we all have strengths at, and some of them we have opportunities to grow. And having self-awareness around that is really the first step to say, okay, for example, I might be great at cognitive agility, but self-compassion is a challenge for me. And so let me lean on my cognitive agility already today, and let me work on my, on my self-compassion. Um, the brief version on the, what these five are, so emotional regulation is in some ways, the foundational skill of, of maturing as an adult is our ability to recognize our emotions, to pause in response to them, to reappraise them, and then to choose a response that comes from kind of whole, integrated, uh, thoughtful place, centered place, 
versus an emotionally reactive place. It's not about silencing the emotions, but it is about giving ourselves space to respond in a, a more centered fashion. Mm -hmm. Cognitive agility is simply how we move back and forth, not just between ideas, but between altitudes of thinking. So uh, analyzing the forest and then picking a tree we're going to focus on. Being able to go back and forth between those altitudes is so much what's required in, in today's world of work and drives our ability to be resilient and not get stuck in one particular solution, one particular uh, mindset. Optimism, I will leave to, to Marty to tell us about self-compassion simply is uh, the ability to extend to ourselves the grace that we extend others in times of challenge. So think about what's happening to you as if it's happening to someone else. And then self-efficacy is kind of like self-confidence. It's a belief that we can overcome, that we can accomplish our goals. And it's built through seeing successive wins. It can be in lots of different arenas and it transfers over. Um, it, it generalizes from one arena to another. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it amounts to a sense that I can accomplish something if I set my mind to it. Um, Marty, would yeah. you perhaps sh say a bit about optimism? Most importantly, given the questions I'm looking at in the chat, uh, all of these drivers of resilience can, one, be measured, and two, they can be built, they can be taught. And indeed, much of the book, Tomorrow Mind, is about the techniques for reliably increasing all five of these drivers. Right. And... That was going to be my next question for you. <laughs> well, do we want to do we want to pause for a moment and just look back at the the other three drivers or uh, keep on? Uh, uh, oh yeah, let's go back quickly yeah, to those. Let's just quickly I'm, go back I'm, because we don't want to. I think we, I want to come back to resilience, but I didn't want to overlook these either. Um, yeah, great. Thank you. Do you want to speak to innovation, Marty, and then I can do the the last two? Yeah, I had the privilege of spending three years of my life. Uh, in meetings specifically with the most innovative, creative people in 11 different fields. And so we asked the question, uh, what is uh, creative thinking? And now in the innovative literature, uh, it starts with divergent thinking. Well, that's not really very helpful. So the question we asked were, what specifically are the different kinds of creative thinking that we can engage in. And uh, I think there are four of them. And uh, I, I know this well from science. Gabriella knows it well from the world of commerce. Let me talk about them. The first creative uh, mindset, the first creative skill is integration. Integration is seeing that things that look different are really the same. And indeed, this is what Isaac Newton uh, was great at. And so the story that you learned in school about the apple is actually close to true. Uh, what happened was at age 21, back at the farm during the plague year, one evening, uh, Newton was sitting near an apple tree and the moon rose I'll jump in on the on the commercial. So Marty was going to give the scientific example of integrative yeah. thinking. The commercial a commercial example of integrative thinking is the iPhone. Um, so a, a major integrative victory for us to put so many different functions all in one place. Um, the the four types of uh, innovation that where integration is the first one. Splitting would be the next one, which is the opposite of integration. So the idea that two things that we thought were the same are actually different. Third is uh, figure ground reversal, which is realizing that what's most essential about a problem is, uh, is not what's in the foreground, but what's in the background. Um, and then the last one is called distal thinking, which is more about being able to imagine something that's very different, so different from the here and now that hard for the rest of us to understand it, hard for us to us around it. So part of our contribution on this innovation part of PRISM is to say there's different ways of thinking about uh, a creative problem. And within an organization, there will be different strengths and there will be 
uh, different areas where the organization needs to actually shore up both its talent and uh, shore up the capabilities uh, within particular teams to have a more well-rounded creative approach. Right. The two others on there in the, in the PRISM acronym, social connection. Um, social connection is essential for uh, our world of work, both for us to thrive personally in our well-being, and as I was saying earlier, for us to be able to serve our customers well, for us to be able to innovate, rely on collaboration. Um, at the same time, we are working largely remotely. We have very little time to connect. And we are navigating difference, which is coming up in, in so many of the conversations today. We're navigating not just the, the, the major dimensions like race and gender and ethnicity, but differences that uh, seem smaller and still really divide us at work. Things like function, things like language, things like um, the, the background, the training that we have. Um, these can be forces that pull us apart, and yet we need to be able to work quickly together in a way that um, has a, a high element of trust embedded. And then the last one is mattering, and, and mattering is all about the fuel that keeps us working throughout these challenges. So um, if you think about what it takes to get up and try again, time after time after time, um, we need a sense of purpose to do that. And at the, at the very least, we need to believe that our labors matter. Matter is mattering is what's get us out of bed in the morning. Um, and it is a big part of the modern manager's job to narrate mattering to help explain to each and every person on their team why their labors matter, why they should believe that it matters even when they have to walk away from six months of work to do something completely different. Um, the skill of building mattering for others is a big part of what we believe is missing in the, the modern approach to management. Okay. Thank you, Gabriella. And I see that uh, um, we do have uh, Marty back with us. Marty, I think you just need to turn on your camera. And uh, I, I can hear you again. I was cut out for about five minutes. Yes, we uh, were afraid we lost you. And if you're able to turn on your camera, we should be able to see you again as well. Um, we just have about five minutes left. So I wanted to um, jump over to audience questions because I know we've got a lot of questions for you. Um, I also wanted to add for the audience that uh, the work that Marty addressed early in this session, uh, that he, the research that he did with the Army, um, uh, it was uh, kind enough to to co-write with a couple of other authors, um, uh, an article for Song Management Review that you can find uh, on our website if you search on Marty's last name. But it's a really nice detailed uh, look at the work that was done linking uh, performance and uh, and well-being and optimism. So in our, in our remaining uh, five minutes, um, I, I think that, uh, well, what, well, we've addressed this a little bit, but it, it might be helpful to uh, to revisit because uh, the question asked whether re how, to what degree resilience is a uh, it comes from innate personality traits and the degree to which it can be um, developed, and what are some of the interventions, some of the ways that people can develop that. Yeah. Um, well, the, the short version is it absolutely can be developed, and, and that's one of the gifts Marty has given humanity is showing us that it can. This is not a diagnose audio situation. Um, and, uh, and, and dovetailing with some of the other questions in the chat, uh, a personalized approach is going to work best. That's part of why we've contributed these five drivers is because you can for any individual, determine where they're stronger, stronger and where they need to focus um, and get to a, a more efficient use of, of the time spent developing it. Understood. The, the most important uh, way of dealing with uh, pessimism, the risk factor for collapse and op building optimism, is to uh, first learn to recognize the most catastrophic things you say to yourself when bad things occur and treat them as if they were being said by a third person whose mission in life was to make you miserable. Mm -hmm. Then to argue realistically against 
the most catastrophic thoughts you have. Right, right. Good. And uh, um, we had, we had a couple of other questions that were, again, related to um, a uh, to, to the to how we can develop some of these skills and so i wanted to put up this slide that gabriella had provided to me a few weeks ago um because this uh, is for an exercise i believe that and, and gabriella you are you you can advance this as you go um using the arrows in the bar below um you can have slide control from your screen uh, but this was an exercise that uh that sounded really interesting that i i thought might be helpful as people are asking for um examples of interventions this is the key to becoming realistic arguing right. against ca catastrophizing gabriella you've got some great uh examples and corporations why don't why don't you do the the noon friday message okay sure so um so this is an exercise that helps us in an environment of uncertainty it can be applied to any environment of uncertainty um and a version of it was used to train soldiers in the army and marty's work uh over the last couple of decades so imagine that it is noon on a friday um, and you are working away and you suddenly get a message from your boss's assistant pops up on your computer, says that the boss needs to meet with you. And here's the, the link for where to go or the room for where to go if you're in person. Uh, be there at 430. That's it. That's all you get. So there's a signal from the external environment. It could mean a lot of different things. Um, some people will have an immediate imagined response and interpretation, which is that this must be bad news. It's Friday afternoon. I'm not getting any other information. It's the very end of the day. And they will imagine a, what's actually a worst possible outcome, which is that they might be getting fired and being getting fired, getting, you know, something bad is happening. And I'm being told this at the end of the week so that my boss doesn't have to deal with me the rest of the week. That is a natural response in some ways, but it can be so uh, overwhelming. We can get into a fight or flight, even just imagining the response to it, right? And so all that's happened from the external world is, is we've gotten a message from a, uh, an assistant, and now we're living in a reality where not only might I get fired, but I, I start to believe I will get fired. I am getting fired. I'm going to change my resume. I'm going to stop working on everything else and just focus on how am I going to deal with getting fired? And again, all that's happened was I got a signal of uncertainty from the external environment. So in any of those situations, you can put a simple line on a paper like this, worst possible, most likely, best possible. You already charted your worst possible. Now you're going to flex yourself all the way to the other side of the spectrum and say, What's the best possible outcome? Really force yourself to think about what those are. In this case, maybe you're getting promoted, you're getting a raise, the boss might be moving off to another role, and you're getting into there. There's all kinds of uh, unlikely but very positive outcomes. And then you want to spend some time in the very middle of the spectrum and chart out what are all the most likely possible reasons that this signal, all the most poss likely possible outcomes this signal could be pointing to. And visually, you start to see that there's a bell curve here, and that is a more realistic distribution of possibilities. It recenters you. Now, you don't have to spend the next four hours of your Friday cleaning up your resume and reactivating your network. You can keep working on what you need to be working on, be centered, go into this meeting with your boss in a much healthier headspace, um, open to possibility, but also ready for whatever could be coming. Great, thank you so much. And I'm afraid, and I'm very sorry to our audience who's been asking a lot of questions, but I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. I'm really grateful for both of you um, spending the time to join us. Um, excellent book, highly recommend it, um, both as a manager and as an individual. I think it's, it's really full of helpful insights and I hope it's landing with, uh, with, uh, with, with the companies that are still open and, and willing to invest in this kind of work because it's really important work that you're doing. So so thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Gabriella and um, Marty. That was so interesting. Thank you so much.
So George Westerman, senior lecturer here at the MIT Sloan School of Management is gonna lead the next session. But before we invite George and his panelists to the stage, we'd like to share some information about a very cool program he's leading to expand education around the world. Let's watch a short video. I'm George Westerman, founder of the Global Opportunity Initiative in MIT's Office of Open Learning. The Global Opportunity Initiative, the GOI, is a community of organizations who are all working together for one goal, making workforce learning work better for employers and employees. We want to do this at global scale for people and organizations around the world. There's a lot of change happening in companies, and much more is coming soon. But unfortunately, the way we find and train and grow employees is not keeping up with everything else. And we want to change that. We see three main challenges, all of which need some transformation. Better advice on career navigation, more agile ways to teach people skills, and new ways to certify what people know and learn. Doing this can help people grow in their careers, but it can also help companies to maintain the workforce pipelines that they need. So how does the GOI work? Well, our collaborating organizations get together to tell their stories, to share best practices, and tackle some tough challenges together. Then at MIT, we help to make that happen by convening the right people, by communicating information and stories, by collaborating in research projects and working groups. We work with companies and nonprofits and governments and policymakers and educators, anybody who has a role to play in helping people to grow and thrive in their careers. So you wanna be part of this mission? To learn more about how we work, you can visit goi.mit.edu or just write to me at georgew at mit.edu. I hope you want to be part of this important effort. We're going to change the world of workforce learning for each company and each employee around the world. Hello, everybody. You've seen what we're up to uh, right now with, with the Global Opportunity Initiative. And, you know, it's an important thing. It's a big thing. We'll do a little bit, but if we can start this kind of conversation going, it will be better for all of us. Uh, and we can do our small part and other people can do even more. That's the real challenge that companies face right now is this question of career development. You know, it's interesting uh, when Abby and I were writing this research, we talked to a lot of leaders uh, on this and this prior research and it would ask them, how good is your company at career development? And the answer was always, we're good at it. And then we'd ask, well, what about for the people who are not the high potentials? And then the story might be something different because, you know, the high potential programs, companies understand the importance of that. And you invest a lot to make that work, but you're doing that for a very small percentage of your people because it's expensive. It's high intensity, you know, that kind of thing. What can we do for, for other people too? So here's this, this article just came out last month in the, uh, in the journal and, you know, I hope you enjoy reading it, but let me just touch, share a little bit of facts. First of all, does this matter? Does career path, does career pathing, does career advancement really matter? Well, here's just a little bit of data. 63% of people who changed jobs in 2021 said it was for correct lack of career opportunities. It was the top cited reason people quit, according to McKinsey last year. Uh, we did our own survey of 1,016 employees. Two thirds of the people want to advance. Now, other people don't want to advance, either because they're in jobs where advancement isn't mad, it doesn't matter, or it's just not important for them. But of the people that, that wanted to advance, half of them said that they were being held back by lack of good career advice. Now that's half at the individual contributor level, about a third at the manager level. So we do see a difference there too of what the managers and the individual contributors are experiencing. Something else that's really important though is this, 35%, a third of the people said that their next job is likely to be on a different path from the current one. That's a real challenge for companies because companies tend to be, you know, if you're going to be good, you're going to be good at helping people move up. Those horizontal, the, uh, the diagonal is a tougher thing to make work. So clearly we're seeing that career paths matter, career advancement matters. And if you don't give it, people are likely to leave your company. But what does that mean about how to do it well? We heard over and over again, two narratives, and I'll, I'll go ahead and call them false narratives in companies about how you do career advancement for, mo for most of the, the majority of your workers. These both sound good, but they're not quite as good as they sound. Number one, managers are responsible to develop their employees' careers. Well, that sounds like a great idea, except managers may not want to do that. 
certainly in my career, many others, you know, you've had a manager who doesn't want you to advance and leave their group because you're a good performer. Um, there, there may be other issues that are that are getting in the way. Even when the managers want to help, they may not have the knowledge to help. They might not be able to help you connect to the right kinds of jobs, or they may be out of dated knowledge uh, that, that you need to do something about. And then there's the other question. If I want to move somewhere that's not in my manager's department, am I even willing to tell my manager that? Because the psychological safety questions, would that come back and hurt me in other ways? So this idea of managers are responsible to develop their employees' careers, it sounds great and it works for some managers. There are a lot of ways this doesn't work at all. The other is we empower employees to develop their own careers. And that also sounds really interesting, right? So let's give a lot of career pathing tools. Let's give a lot of free, free learning that people can do. This especially sounds good to the senior executives who are funding these kinds of programs because they're the go-getters. They're the ones that can look up and say, hey, I made it. They may not remember the high potential programs. They might remember, not remember that boss who took a chance on them when, you know, when they might not have otherwise. Um, so what happens is if you believe this story, then when an employee doesn't advance, you tend to blame the employee and not the system. And so you know, these we call two false narratives because they sound good, but they just aren't as good as they seem. So the question is how to do this well. Well, those of you who are Star Wars fans know that today is a very special day of the year. Uh, may the fourth be with you. And you know, when we think through Star Wars, there are two really good examples here of how to do employee development really well and how to do it not so well at all. And now you'd think Luke and Anakin, they were high potentials and it didn't always work quite the right way. Depends what outcome you're looking for, for these people. What we wanna talk about though is how can you do this for the rest of your employees? How can you do it without spending the kind of time and personal attention and real effort that you put into your high potentials? How can you make it work for, for other people and still get the, the good outcome and not the bad one? So when we went out uh, through our survey research and also through our interviews with companies, we found three steps to make this possible. Now, here's the thing. Most of you know these three steps already because they're what you're doing in your high potential programs. But the question is, why aren't we, they, you doing them? Why aren't companies doing this for everybody? And the paths look like this. Number one, make the opportunities and the pathways visible. People tend to know what the step is up above, but they don't know what other opportunities are available for the skills that they have. And actually inside companies is tricky too. We heard over and over again, this disconnect between supply and demand, that it may be easier to hire externally than to find a good internal candidate and vice versa for your, your people themselves. It may be easier to find a job externally than inside your company. So the, the other thing that's really tricky here is if my jobs don't, if, if my skills help me move up, how might they apply for a horizontal position where I might not have made that connection? Number two is the opportunities to learn and to practice. Everybody has their training programs for good and for bad. Abby and I have done research on how to do that in the modern way, uh, the, uh, a more transformative way to make that happen. But then how do you put the practice element in there too? So, you know, this could be, um, games to try it out, right? This could be um, short opportunities. That, that one of the things that Schneider does with its, um, Schneider Electric does with its internal talent market is give you a chance to try a project and you can see how that project works. And if it works for you and for the boss, that might be an opportunity for you to do others. Uh, another uh, big insurance company, Allianz, as part of your performance review, once you've talked about what you want to do, the job, your manager has to find something in there that they can help you get some practice in that area. So how can you do the practice, not just the learning? And then last but not least is this idea of um, strong feedback and coaching, which we all know that we can improve on, we can do better, more than the annual review, much more substantive than just the last five minutes of the hour when you run out of time. So we have two great speakers here who are thinking hard through this. Not a lot of companies are doing all of this. Many companies are making good progress in some areas and here are two companies that are making really great progress. So I, I want to introduce you to um, the, Tony Gelati from UPMC and also uh, Lainey Montoya from Pernova Card and A. So we'll start it off with Lainey. Hello, everyone. Thank you, George. Um, and thank you to the MIT team for my, inviting me to be a host on this very 
um, I would say, important and interesting topic that we're also working on very closely at Pernor Card. I'm really honored to be here. So I'm the head of HR for Pernor Card North America, and we are the number two world leader in the spirits industry, wines and spirits. We have over 240 premium brands that are distributed across 160 markets with 18,500 employees. The Pernova Card North America affiliate is the biggest market and we employ around 2,000 employees with offices and production sites across the US and Canada. So that's just to tell you a little bit about Pernova Card um, and very similar to what George has described, our journey has been very much around centered around the employee really driving their career. And then there's aspects of that that are definitely owned by the company. We have, of course, high performance uh, programs uh, that we do um, at a more senior level and for critical roles. Uh, but for the most part, we have really put in place a system that allows individuals to really own their career. It's a journey we started about five years ago as we as we started to really expand our uh, talent management processes and really bring a more holistic employee centered approach to what we do. Um, and a lot of that was centered around the way that we manage performance, um, the way that we assess potential, um, the way that we understand how our employees want to develop their careers. What is it that they are interested in doing? Uh, what skills do they want to develop? And we rolled out a global system called Workday that actually gave visibility across all levels of the organization and across all of our markets to positions that are available in the organization at different levels. So the visibility is definitely there. We have an employee opinion survey called I Say, where we're constantly listening in to what our employees are saying. And we're learning from this to make sure that we are providing those opportunities for employees. But it's, you know, we are, uh, like many companies, really still at a early stage in this area where we're putting in a lot of the, the environment and the ecosystem to really foster career development. And now we need to work uh, closer with AI uh, to really accelerate and provide even more visibility across all of our employees so they can develop their skills and co-manage their careers with their manager, HR, and, uh, and the employee. So we've, we've aligned our leadership model. We have leadership behaviors across all positions of the organization. And this is really how we expect our employees to behave in, in the workplace. And we look at elements like what you do and how you do it. Um, and so these are all aspects to really drive performance um, as well as, as potential. And then very excited to say that we have Project Horizons, which is really um, a tool that's going to bring a lot of that visibility to employees so that they're, they're able to own the way that they want to develop their skills in the organization through different projects, as well as allow them to profile themselves uh, for different opportunities across the organization. So it's a benefit to HR because we will be able to source skill sets in the organization more rapidly when we have positions available. Also for managers who are looking for certain skill sets to be able to identify who holds those skill sets and for employees to be able to develop skill sets that they want for specific roles. So we are on a journey. Um, it's very exciting. We still do believe that each one of these components, the employee, the manager, and HR really play a role in how careers are, are driven in the organization. And now I'm going to pass it over to Tony. Thanks so much, Lainey. And good day, everyone. I'm Tony Gelati. I'm the Senior Director of Talent Management and Organizational Development at UPMC. And it's a real pleasure to be with all of you today. For context, UPMC is a multinational healthcare provider and insurer headquartered in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We have 95,000 employees, 800 physician offices and outpatient centers, 40 U.S. and six European hospitals, and 4.5 million subscribers to our health insurance products. You know, for several years now, we've been uh, listening to our employee voice, primarily from our employee engagement survey that we call My Voice. We noted that staff really crave dialogue about their career development with their supervisors. 
and they were indicating through the survey that they wanted more opportunities for their training and professional development. From our turnover data, we noted that the number one reason why employees left our organization in 2022 was for career advancement. Now, this was quite perplexing to me as a talent leader in the organization because UPMC has hundreds, if not thousands of career opportunities throughout our vast organization. And we offer a wide array of internal development opportunities and benefits that support employees who wish to advance their education. This was a challenge for us, a real conundrum. And we framed our challenges in three specific ways. One, how can we truly encourage employees to be proactive about identifying their career aspirations at UPMC and truly discussing a plan of action with their leaders? Two, how do we transparently share the many career opportunities that are available throughout UPMC? And three, which career tools and resources are most valuable to our employees? These guiding questions helped us create three career development resources for our employees, and we introduced them uh, during our kickoff of our annual performance evaluation process, which was late last year. And that particular process has high visibility throughout the organization. The three new resources that we introduced are simply an expanded section of the optional self-evaluation, which is part of the annual performance evaluation process. This new section prompts employees for their feedback on their career aspirations at UPMC. And we also ask them, what type of support do you need from the organization or from your manager? Our objective here is to catalyze a career conversation between the employee and their leader, certainly during the performance evaluation process itself, but also thereafter. We were delighted to see that over 72% of our population chose to complete a self-evaluation and the overwhelming majority of those individuals also completed the new section of the self-eval. Secondly, we introduced what we call the My Career at UPMC site on our intranet. And this was created by employees for employees. It packages our many career development tools and resources into one easy to access site. Within four months, that site had over 8,500 hits to it. And last but certainly not least, is what we call our Explore Careers section of our human capital management system. Explore Careers transparently shares the employee's individual career path with them so they can see where they are in that path, the jobs that are above theirs and those that are beneath theirs. But Explore Careers goes beyond just my own career path. It also presents me with career paths from other job families within the organization. I can click on any role and also obtain the job description so I can better understand what that job entails as well as the qualifications for that role. If any of the roles look interesting to me, I can quickly see if there are vacancies. And of course, we wanted to cross-reference through Explore Careers and we linked to the My Careers at UPMC, again, which provides many career development tools. Astoundingly, Explore Careers within two months had 250,000 hits to this particular site. And within four months, we had nearly a half a million hits from our employees. That represents over 25,000 unique users who are quite engaged with the site. So although these resources are fairly new, we're hopeful that they will continue to evolve and meet our employees' career development needs. Well, fantastic. Uh, and can we bring uh, Lainey back on the camera also? Ah, perfect, good, we're all here then. Uh, such great stories and you know, it's been nice to, to get to know you over the last couple of years as you've been making such, such amazing progress on this, even you know, each year, even with the pandemic coming on in this situation. You know, You've made a lot of changes. You put a lot of things in there. 
if you would say there was one thing, a mechanism or a mindset or something that just clicked and made this work better, what would it be? You want to start us off, Lainey? Sure. Um, I would say um, for us, it was really uh, driving um, feedback in the organization. We came from an organization that was really, um, we promote a lot from within and we build skill sets within the organization. And very rarely do we seek, you know, external talents unless we don't have the capability within. So we really believe in building capabilities within the organization. As a result of that, feedback was not as strong as it could have been. Um, and so we have really focused on feedback, one, helping managers and equipping them to be able to have the right feedback discussions, making feedback as normal as it can be. So it's really implemented in all of our processes and going a step further with really thinking about feedback as a development source rather than you know, something that we, we shy away from. And so we put in place development centers, um, one of them uh, called Lead Up, which we offer at a global level. And then of course we have the normal 360 feedbacks, we have them implemented into the system, we have peer feedbacks. So we've really sort of rolled out feedback in the last couple of years across um, all levels of the organization. So I would say feedback is really a gift um, and that's the way we really drive the mindset within the organization. And so different from a lot of places where I've been where feedback was just something you had to do once a year and, and get through the hour and then you were done. So uh, very different. Thanks. Tony? I'd say for us, the uh, Explore Careers application, for, for several years now, our employees have been asking for more transparent sharing of their career path information, as well as simple access to job descriptions for a variety of other roles across the organization. And George, you mentioned earlier that some employees may not have that psychological safety to talk with their leaders about their career aspirations. And so now they have at their fingertips a lot of information where they can do the research on their own without involving their leader per se. Uh, and I think that that will empower more employees with knowledge and they would be able to really close any skill or knowledge gaps that they may have and work towards that targeted role. So Explore Careers uh, certainly has been a game changer for us. Thank you. You know, both of you touched on this concept about a certain trust and a certain confidence that if I make my wishes known that the organization will do something about that. So how, how do you build that trust? This came up actually a question from the group, but now's a great time to ask it. And, and either one wants to talk. Well, first and foremost, I think it is about equipping leaders to have these conversations. Just because someone has the title of leader does not mean that they have the skill set to have career development conversations, crucial conversations, performance conversations. So for us, a lot of it simply starts with uh, training and skilling, but we try to go beyond that as well. And, and we try to find the best leaders in the organization and really highlight, highlight them, put them on stage, help us train other leaders. And we ask them, uh, you're in this scenario, what do you do? What do you say? How do you carry yourself? And I find that other leaders can learn a lot from those best practice leaders and gain important tips and tools so that when they're ready to have the conversation, they're setting the, the right foundation, one that's positive, one that's engaging, and something that we care a lot about is one that's caring. Uh, for our employees. Great. And, you know, certainly the horizontal is even harder than the vertical, the horizontal, the, the diagonal, because even if I want to help as a manager, I may not know how. So have you found good ways or, or less good ways to make the uh, horizontal and, and diagonal conversations and development work? I think for us, um, it goes a, a bit to what Tony has said. We have a lot of, um, you know, with with this tool that we were able to ro roll out Workday, which is um, an excellent um, sort of talent management tool, along with a very strong process, um, we really were able to bring much more visibility to the to the employees. And so they're able to see horizontally, vertically positions. They can go into the tool and see different org charts so they can see how teams are structured. If they were interested in a role, they could see how it sits within that within that team. 
Uh, we also have globally a very strong HR community of business partners. So you can speak to your HR business partner at a local level and they can connect with the, in, you know, the HR business partner in that other affiliate and they can discuss about the position, how does it sit, um, and we also have a global job grading process. Um, and what this does is really allows employees to have visibility to positions that are at their level, at all levels, but they can relate to what's at my level, what's higher and what's below my level. So they have some sort of reference um, to how these positions sit within the organization and against their own, uh, their own role. Um, so this is really, I think a lot of it is, as Tony said, it's visibility, it's education, it's feedback, it's partnership, right? This is not something that employees can do on their own. There has to be an ecosystem that really um, facilitates that. And one of the things that we've done is we strongly believe that the line manager um, and the employee relationship is key, but we want to empower our employees. And so when we say own your career, it's really about the organization giving you the power, the tools and resources to be able to navigate and do that the way you want with whatever, you know, your learning style is because we all have different learning styles. Um, so th these are some things that we've put into the process and now also with AI into tools to be able to provide that to all of our employees across the organization. So, um, how do you know, you know, we've been talking about OKRs and stuff all morning. How do you know career development is working? So I, I would say uh, it it isn't uh, HR saying, hey, we have great programs, come work for us, right? Or leaders even saying that. We, of course, we have uh, a bit of an incentive to uh, always be a cheerleader for our organization and our programs. I think it, it goes back to what are our consumers saying? Who are our employees? And it comes down to constantly uh, checking in with our My Voice survey, our employee engagement survey. It's uh, constantly monitoring turnover and reasons for turnover, listening to the employee's voice. And uh, having that be our foundation for any type of strategies that we put together and making sure that we're balancing not just employee needs, uh, and those are, again, communicated through these various organizational tools, but we're also finding a middle ground. We can't forget about what the organization needs as well. And so really trying to strike a good balance between the two, but really listening to our consumers, our employees, and ensuring that our uh, that ver their voice is really driving our strategies. Lainey, do you have a, a set of measures you think about? Can you Hello, hear me? Lainey? Yeah, we can hear you, yes. Hello? Yep, sorry, this was um, stuck a little. Uh, so we, we very much to, to what Tony said, um, we do the same. I think uh, part of it is also our uh, ability to acquire. Uh, many times when we go and look for talent, they talk about the career development that they've heard about within the organization or from referrals. Um, it really also, we can see it in the diversity um, in the organization that we're seeing, um, specifically when you have been mainly building capability within and now you're able to see you know, diversity in all different forms within the organization. Um, and really our, our EVP, when we measure our EVP, um, our turnover rates, um, we, you know, we, we look at all of those aspects around career development, but it's really important, I think, to continue to evolve. I think career development is one of those things that it can't stay stagnant. You've got to pay attention to it. And as we continue to progress with the way people want to drive their careers and the level of um, I would say skill building that they can do on their own or through the organization and really bringing the human approach, uh, not just looking at the person's skill sets within the work, but really who they are even outside of the workplace, I think really drives career development. Okay, thank you. So we have about five minutes left. Just wanna take a few more questions. We've, I've incorporated a few of them into the questions that, that uh, I, I asked you, but a few more questions from the audience. Uh, there's a there's a question specifically for Lainey, but I think it applies also to you, Tony. When you're asking people to fill out their skills and their career profiles, there's a temptation to just load everything in there rather than ones that you are, think are most important. Does this really happen? And what advice do you have for helping the employees create this data the right way? So Lainey was the one that came to, but yeah. 
I, I can uh, I can take that one first. Yeah. Um, so we have what we call talent profiles, um, and this is an opportunity for the employee to really showcase uh, their skill sets, what they've achieved, certifications, uh, their experience, um, education, and so on. It's, I would say, um, an ongoing challenge to get employees to fill that. So we do a campaign every year, um, a few times a year, to really help employees um, uh, keep this top of mind, as well as um, we we explain to them how it's being used in the organization so they see the benefit of why they're, they're completing this. Um, and we do use it for, as we look for people for different positions, this is really our source of, you know, of truth for, for, on the individual. Um, and so it's, it's, um, it's, it's an ongoing process. I would say it's not perfect. Um, I would love for employees to put everything. In fact, the system that we have is great because it allows you to really segment all of the different um, areas and gives you so much spacing. So it kind of helps you limit, uh, but it also allows you to not just focus on what you do at work, but what you also do externally that can develop your skill sets. Um, and employees actually, they don't fill it in enough. Some of it is automated. So the system will automate, autom populate some things for the employee. And we do that through the reviews, annual reviews. But in terms of really building their skill set profile, I wish uh, they would, you know, upload as many skill sets as possible. Uh, but today they keep it quite simple. Um, but we, we've put it in place now, it's four years, and we continue to drive campaigns um, to have those completed. Okay. And Tony, do you have the same thing, people not giving enough, or do you have them giving too much? What's the right, right formula? We are at the uh, beginning stages of talent profile, so I was hoping Lainey had the an all the answers <laughs> uh, to that we could leverage. Um, we are we are looking right now at whether we have open fields where you can place any skills, or whether we start out with a, a, a key uh, foundation uh, of skills, and then just simply have employees select the ones that they are competent in. Um, so we're debating that with our HR teams as to whether it'll just be a free flow of information or whether we'll we'll put some boundaries on that, at least in the beginning. But I agree with Lainey that, you know, our, our folks are so busy being in healthcare and, oh, being in a pandemic and coming out of a pandemic that when we're asking people to fill out talent profiles, uh, you know, sometimes it's really, I have a few <laughs> more important things to do at this point in time. So there has to be a what's in it for me, though. I think if, if, if employees are going to spend the time providing this information, um, then they need to know that there's some ROI for their efforts. And if we're not building that into the strategy, then we probably will not get uh, great compliance. So we're, we're also thinking through that as well. Well, and you highlight something else that we're trying to do here in the Global Opportunity Initiative, which is to get some birds of the feather working groups together on, you know, what are the data science skills that need at different levels or how can you think about, you know, the data in the career path thing. So, uh, you know, I know we talk all the time, but if other people are interested, please talk to me about, about that in the GOI. Uh, a question for Tony, and of course it comes back to Lainey. Tony, you mentioned five career development questions. Can you give us a couple of those? As long as I get royalties on them, sure. <laughs> Very simple. I call them power questions as a, as a coach. You know, I, I like questions that really get people thinking. And I will tell you, uh, when I was doing my own self-evaluation, I came to those five questions and I thought, wow, these are hard. Um, but quite honestly, uh, it, it simply is, you know, where, where do you want to go in your career? What, what's your target role at, at UPMC? So we're not encouraging them to look outside. We were very specific about saying at UPMC. Uh, what tools and resources do you need? Um, what knowledge might you need to, to glean? What skills do you need to build? And, and really, how can your manager assist you? So um, having these simple questions that we often don't ask ourselves, and uh, managers often don't ask their employees, but boy, having that information can result in, in a pretty powerful uh, career conversation between the manager and the employee. So a very simple question really costs us nothing to expand that self-evaluation, but um, getting a lot of rich feedback now. Great, thank you. So we have one minute left, and I, I, I wanted just to give you guys both a chance to just say, could you, in 10 words or less, 
Uh, what advice do you have for leaders in other companies about how to create a good career development process for all employees? Let's start with Lainey. Uh, so I would say, you know, be obsessed, um, be obsessed with feedback, um, be obsessed with learning, with uh, skill set building. Um, I think it's, you know, we, we need to really think about the role the employee plays. So there's something for the employee, there's something for uh, the organization, and then there's, of course, something for, for the manager. So I really do believe it's, it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy um, if everyone works together. Um, and we have the right process in place to really build um, the highest standards in, uh, in career development. It's all about really developing yourself um, and giving individuals the opportunity to do that. Okay, great. And on to you, Tony, what's your 10 words or slightly more? <laughs> okay, my 10 words or less is build a process that addresses both employee and organizational needs. And you know, when we think about career development, of course, there's a what's in it for me. Uh, for the individual employee, but it also means more engaged employees. It means employees that we retain and we avoid turnover costs. So there's also a big what's in it for me for the organization. And being able to tell that full story, I think, is really important in order to get buy-in from a multitude of stakeholders, both at that, that employee level all the way up to the executive level. Wonderful. I want to thank you both for being here. Uh, I've learned so much from from talking to you. And of course, now you've been able to share some of that knowledge with the larger group. My request would be take this idea of career development for everybody, take it to heart. If you've got those two false narratives, do something to make them less false and make them real to help the employees make this progress happen. And of course, if you want to learn more about what we are doing in the Global Opportunity Initiative, just send me an email. I'd love to talk to you. Thank you. For most companies today, the workforce is a lot more than just full-time employees includes contractors, freelancers, gig workers, and more. Our next speakers have spent the past four years researching what it takes to coordinate and successfully manage that expanded workforce. Their new book, Workforce Ecosystems, Reaching Strategic Goals with People, Partners, and Technologies, is available now from MIT Press. In this session, they'll share the highlights of what they've learned so far. Welcome, Liz and David. Fantastic to be here uh, with uh, co-author and guest editor and professor Liz Altman. Um, MIT Press published our book a few weeks ago, Liz, and let's talk about why it's timely and important. Uh, but before we do that, let's give a shout out to our other co-authors, Jeff Schwartz and Robin Jones, uh, who made like tremendous contributions to this book as well, and it was finally great to uh, uh, get, meet them all together live in person in Dallas a couple weeks ago. Uh, let's start off by providing a little bit of context about what the problem is that we're trying to that we were trying to solve with this research. And you have a lovely little story about how you, as a strategy professor, uh, was brought onto this project. Uh, and let's start there. Well, thank you, David. Uh, actually, maybe I'll go back if you want a quick story on how I was brought onto this project. But uh, I appreciate uh, being here. It's been incredible to be involved with this team over the past few years. And so um, thank you to SMR and to Deloitte Consulting for uh, working together on this work. We put together essentially a little workforce ecosystem, as we like to say. So uh, when you first sent me an email um, early 2020 and said kind of uh, this isn't spam and I know who you are and would you like to join us as guest editor of the future of the workforce? I said, you know, this is really interesting. I've looked at your work and it's mostly been focused inside of organizations, which is fabulous and it's been really great work. But I really tend to think about what happens between organizations and across organizational boundaries. I mostly study platforms and ecosystems. I'm a strategy professor. And so this may not be a great match. Maybe we shouldn't do this. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Maybe not such a good idea. And you said, no, no, no. We know what you study. And I think very insightfully said, we think this conversation should really expand cross organizational boundaries. And we agreed that if we could do an experiment and really think, try to think more about this with an ecosystem lens, that this might be a great idea. And at the time, I think you said, look, if it goes well, maybe we'll write a book. And then, you know, a few weeks ago, we launched the book, which is just amazing. So when we started the project, uh, 
we started having these conversations about future of the workforce. What exactly are we talking about? And we started doing these interviews. And really, even in those early interviews, I realized it made sense to start with a discussion of, if I say workforce, what do you mean? And we were talking to some very senior people, like the head of uh, HR for Walmart, or the head of the consumer business at Amazon, or two army generals, or senior people at NASA, the Mayo Clinic. It was an amazing array of people. And to a person, when I said, when you think about workforce, or when I say workforce, what do you think of? And I said it hesitantly, slightly like that, because in the beginning, I thought, they may think this is a really dumb question. Uh, to the contrary, they said, that is a great question. We've been thinking a lot about it. Uh, we were just in a meeting about it this morning. We should talk more about that. And we went on. they went on to say, look, it's clearly employees. If you're in the US, they're W-2, either full or part-time, but it's also contractors, freelancers, gig workers. We started hearing numbers like 30 to 50% of the contributing members of a workforce weren't employees. And you'll see that they also, um, this is an example from TopDial, they're very skilled, very high level people, right? So there's some lower level people, but they're also higher level people. When Amazon decided it wanted to do its um, contract, it wanted to have its own transportation uh, system, it didn't hire people, it started subcontracting, often with mom and pops, but these people add value to Amazon, but don't work for Amazon. If we were in a classroom, I might say, okay, how many people have smartphones? All hands go up. How many people on those phones have only software made by the company that made either the operating system or the phone? All hands go down, right? Because phones are not that interesting, not that much fun and not that helpful unless they have apps. Those apps are developed by what we call complementary businesses, right? Or complementers. And they are not the primary um, business. And so our question is, are they part of the workforce? Well, they're not really vendors and they're not employees, but, but they are part of the workforce. Similarly, when you look at Amazon, how many people have purchased something from Amazon that was actually purchased from someone else? And the answer will usually be a lot, right? Because Amazon is a middleman and these sellers are contributing to Amazon being able to offer what they're able to offer. And finally, we ask the question, so how many people here have recently maybe argued with a chat bot, right? You've called some sort of customer service line, you've tried to get through, you're interacting with the chat bot, or more recently, how many people have played with chat GPT or BARD or any other generative AI um, and can envision how organizations can use that? And the answer is many. Right, and NASA, sorry to interrupt, but like, yeah. and NASA had to give uh, employee identification numbers to some some algorithms in order to sort of get, get right, their- Right, because they couldn't, they couldn't access, the only way to get the uh, chat bots or the bots in that case to access data was by to actually give them employee ID numbers. So in that case, you say, okay, given all of this, are they part of a workforce? And we said, well, if you define the workforce quite broadly, if you define it as a workforce ecosystem, then yes, right? They're, it's composed not only of employees, but also these external contributors. And that is how we kind of set out to start thinking about workforces in a much more holistic ecosystem-based way. With that, I will turn it back to you to help us understand what we found with some of our data. Thanks, Liz. What does that all mean when external contributors are, are considered to be part of an organization's workforce? I mean, it means that the boundaries and composition of the workforce are shifting. It used to be just employees and used to be internal to the firm. And with this workforce ecosystem orientation, it's, uh, it's not just like inside the organization, it's outside the organization as well. And it's not just employees. So that's a non-trivial shift. And it's so non-trivial that three quarters of, of managers agree that effectively managing these external folks is critical to their organization's success. And that's certainly, and it's especially true for organizations like Cisco and Novartis and some of these other organizations that have tens of thousands of external contributors uh, getting the work done. Unfortunately, 
and this is where the problem comes in, is that only 30% of organizations are, are agreeing that their organization is uh, sufficiently preparing to manage a workforce that relies on all of these external contributors. So trying to think, so we found leader after leader struggling with the idea of how to think and act more deliberately and holistically and in an integrated way with both the employees and external contributors. And what we found is that those who are those leaders who are taking this issue seriously considered it to be a holy grail or a, a potential strategic differentiator for them to figure this problem out. So it's not just a matter of like a semantics of who is in your workforce. It's it has dramatic and far-reaching implications for competitive advantage and uh, competitiveness. Based on that, we dove in and uh, conducted a bunch of surveys and interviewed more than 100 executives, and not just in the U.S., not just in the private sector. It was across public and private sectors. It was a global effort. We were talking to folks in Asia, all the different continents uh, that there are, except for Antarctica. So many of them had, it's like 26% were over a billion dollars in revenue, these, these organizations. So it's the, the research was not just us making up some opinions or talking to a few people about this, these issues. Uh, we did global surveys and we talked to a lot of different uh, managers and individuals. And Liz has a bunch of connections with generals in, in the military. She went to West Point or taught at West Point. And uh, we wound up talking to some, some uh, military folks and uh, they had some really uh, interesting perspectives on like, cause, cause they live by having an integrated approach to uh, uh, the military. So throughout the, the conduct of this research, we were publishing a lot of materials. I, I don't know if the number's up to 10, but uh, between publishing articles and research reports and this recent book, uh, the, the infographics, it's probably about 10 outputs related to this research. We're really excited and we think that this is an important avenue for uh, organizations to go along in order to really compete effectively. And by that, I mean, like think in an integrated way and conduct themselves in an integrated way toward both the employees and their uh, uh, extended workforce. So what do we mean by a workforce ecosystem? Take it, Liz. Thanks, David. Uh, so as guest editor, I'm straddling this line, always balancing between being an academic and a professor, but also wanting to come up with ideas and concepts and present them in a way that's very understandable and practical. And so together, we came up with this definition of workforce ecosystem, which we think uh, is very helpful. And we came up with a framework for orchestrating workforce ecosystems, which I will get to in a moment. So first of all, in terms of a definition, you can read it, but we've said a structure, which is a governance structure. It's a way to think about this entity, right? Focused on value creation, because in the end, it's about creating value for organizations. Uh, for an organization consists of complementarities and interdependencies. I'll come back to that one second. And it encompasses actors from within an organization and beyond. As we said, this is about a lot about external contributors and their individual and collective goals. So if everybody's just working towards the goal of the main player in the ecosystem, it will not be sustainable, right? So the individual actors also have to be meeting their goals. Complementarity is what we mean is like with apps, it's organizations working independently and individuals working independently, working together to meet goals and for mutual customers. And interdependencies at its simplest form means they either succeed together or fail together. They have to work together and they're dependent upon each other. So that's our general working definition. We have fun arguing about it, but we think it's pretty solid. We said, okay, so for example, this hexagon started as a circle and at one point was an octagon. However, then we made it a hexagon. Why? And it was on its side, but then we spun it. So this is our favorite hexagon because it is an or and it's an orchestration framework. It represents how we think managers and leaders should think about pulling together 
all the various parts of their ecosystem. And we chose the word orchestrating versus managing, particularly because often these entities are individual, independent, and have their own agency and own goals and objectives. So um, I think we're probably coming towards the end of our time and we need to get to Q&A, so I'll do this very quickly. The, the hexagons themselves represent our key themes. So management practices need to change, technology enablers need to change, leadership approaches, and integration architectures is basically how you coordinate um, a workforce ecosystem. Each of those hexagons is covered in one of the chapters of the book, and we've covered them in different articles because each hexagon represents a whole series of new concepts and thinking when you take a workforce ecosystem's perspective on workforces. Outside the hexagon, we've put the key leaders. Senior leaders and business unit leaders are on the kind of center axis, and essentially the framework can rotate around them. There's a top axis human resources and procurement, because they are generally responsible for enabling or for actually for getting all of the players together. And then IT and finance and legal are on the second axis, second horizontal axis, because they enable the technologies and the systems that make this happen. And we think there are lots of conversations we can have kind of about this framework. And so we've used it really as the basis for conversations. David, back to you. All right, so uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, wonderful, quick uh, 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 representation of that framework. Uh, we have questions coming in. I want to get to those. We both want to get to those. Uh, but just a, a, a reminder, uh, this is the book. Feel free to buy it. Feel compelled to buy it uh, and, uh, and review and uh, compliment it. So um, don't know what we should. So we'll just leave this up during the Q and A. So one of the questions that came in was, "What makes a uh, a workforce ecosystem a workforce ecosystem healthier than another?" And the you know, which gets into the question of like, how do you measure uh, uh, workforce ecosystem qualities? And we talk about this in the book: is that workforce ecosystems have like three main characteristics, comprehensiveness, community, and coordination. And the three, we call it the three C's. And you can have, like, you can be really strong on, the, like the community one can be, you build a community around and for and with uh, the external contributors and you blend them together with the uh, internal folks. Um, and there are others that we've, 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 that we've seen in organizations that are less community oriented it doesn't mean that they're worse. In fact, one of the organizations, Planomatic, which is talked about in the book, they tried to build a stronger community around and with their external uh, contributors, but it wasn't something that really got traction. And so, it just turns out that some sometimes external contributors prefer. A more of a transactional relationship with the firm, and it's and it's a it's a real there are a whole bunch of trade offs that happen around the extent to which you try to um, uh, impose a transactional or community oriented way, and how much you try to elicit uh, or you know uh, adapt to what's there and what anyway. So that's just one dimension. Yes. So. Well, and in that case, I would say they probably do have a very strong community because they need the community to operate. They're, they've played with how to get the culture right between their internal and external. Um, yeah, I, I think you've said it well. I would go back to um, meeting strategic goals, which we put in the title of the book, right? So if a workforce ecosystem is enabling uh, organization to hit their goals and also the goals of the contributors, then it's doing its job, right? And yes, we can do all kinds of metrics along the way, but I think we should stick to remembering that this is fundamentally about value creation and about outcomes. I see we have a, a few, uh, am I allowed to pick questions or are we, because I you, can see- you, you, have, you have permission. We have, we've got three, three minutes, 25 seconds, go for it. Oh, I see five minutes, 37 seconds. Okay, in any case, uh, one quick question, just to clarify, someone says, what do you mean by procurement? And we mean the organization within uh, a company or a business 
usually part of supply chain, but often they're the ones who are doing the contracts with contractors or with large companies supplying contractors. And so that's important because, for example, if they have a contract and it's bringing in 10,000 software developers, then the procurement organization is kind of managing that relationship or a big part of enabling that relationship. And that's why we pull procurement into the conversation. And the other quick question was, um, for social media, how would users like on Facebook and Instagram fall into this category? And I think this is a really interesting question because we get into this question of content creators, customers, contributors, complementers, and each one we can have a conversation about. And I guess I would say that, again, we're trying to take as broad a perspective as possible. So particularly if you think about YouTube or TikTok or but YouTube, definitely, um, those content creators are contributing to the business in a very meaningful way and enabling the business to go forward. So for many platform businesses that rely on contributions from users, those users absolutely, in my mind, are part of the workforce ecosystem. And so that's actually very interesting because the relationship between the company and their customers or contributors is a little more complex than it was when a company was just selling a product to customers. Yeah, and when you move beyond the, the, the content creators uh, and the relationship between platforms and content creators, there are, there are other platforms where there, there are a host of, uh, where, where the, the users have, uh, it, it's, there, there are a bunch of legal and ethical issues that, that come into play. And one of the things we talk about in the in the book is uh, Meta uh, Meta's use of uh, contractors and uh, content moderation, um, and their and then with Uber, uh, there you know there's a whole bunch of legal issues going on not only in this country but in uh, countries around the world of, like. Are they should they, should these users be considered employees or not? Um, should they have access to benefits or not? And these are really important questions. Well, and the third part of the book, and I, I give credit to you here, David, because um, this was the part that you drove more than others. But the third part of the book is about ethics and social responsibilities and corporate social responsibility. And so I think. You know, that's not where this question started, but I think it makes sense for us to mention that we're very aware that this structure leads to all kinds of questions. And someone in the chat mentioned something about um, who owns uh, intellectual property, for example. And that is a, you know, there's an ongoing discussion. There are different mechanisms for working with it. It's not that it hasn't been addressed at all, but I think these discussions continue to evolve as workforce ecosystems become more prevalent. Yeah. Um, so Sorry, go ahead. Just, just one other thing on that is like as someone with a background in ethics, one of the one of the really interesting and I think important aspects of what we're doing in this in this book and with this shift to work, workforce ecosystems is there are some really significant implications for social responsibility and overall purpose for an organization, and uh, you can have workforce ecosystems that. Aren't as aren't as ethical as others, or aren't as uh, uh, they, they they don't promote as much social good as others. And there are a lot of choices for leaders to make around the kind of workforce ecosystem that they want. And uh, we try to set up some of the questions, the key questions for leaders to ask in the, in the book. And if I sound like I'm repeating the book too often. <laughs> As I, I keep saying, I, I never wanted to be that author who always said, oh, it's in the book, but I have become that author. Uh, one quick point here, because it's, uh, again, as a strategy professor, somebody said, when it comes to, Cheryl Strada said, when it comes to strategy and value creation within a workforce ecosystem, does that ultimately fall under the purview of the CEO and CFO? And I would say, you know, one of the things that's been great about this conversation is that we have realized that these discussions move to the C-suite. Right. They are strategic conversations because they're at, they get to the heart of how organizations compete, how they compete against their competitors in an industry, how they develop new 
products and services? Are they moving to new markets? So yes, ultimately we think this is a very cross-functional sea level um, discussion, but we also see it going down deep into an organization, right? Someone can be managing a very small department and part of that department will be internal players and part of it will be maybe a contractor and part of it might be um, relationships with external companies and then also using technologies. So on one hand, it's at the C-suite. On the other hand, we have seen my students and, you know, lower level and mid-level managers very interested in these concepts because they're needing to operate in these complex networked interconnected ecosystem types of environments. So this is, uh, we, as, as, as you folks can tell, we, we, we can, <laughs> we love this stuff. We love this stuff. We're excited to talk about it, but our time is at an end and I'm going to uh, give it over to uh, Ali and uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, this is great. And uh, uh, really excited to see how the book plays with uh, the audience. Great. Thanks very much. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for sticking with us till the end of the session today. And we're closing out um, Work 23 with, I think, one of the most popular topics in the future of work today. Um, so I'm going to introduce Andrew Barnes, who is the co-founder of Four Day Week Global. Um, in 2018, Andrew made headlines with an idea he believed would raise productivity in the workplace while contributing to the well-being of his staff at Perpetual Guardian, New Zealand's largest corporate trustee company. In the years since, Andrew has worked with large companies and close to a dozen countries and governments to pilot four-day workweek programs and implement changes to the way people work. I'm personally very excited to learn more about the results from these pilots. And I also must give a shout out to Andrew, who just joined us as we were coming on. So I will uh, let you take it away if, if everything is all set. Look, four-day week. Um is a journey that we've been on for the last five years. And it essentially started when I had an experiment in my own company. And that was basically to see whether I could improve the productivity in my business. Came up with the concept of what we call the 180-100 rule. Because I wanted to know what would happen if I said to my people, could you do your job better working four days rather than five. But the key thing is obviously we had to be able to deliver the same amount of output, uh, customer service, profitability and productivity. It wasn't just about a whole question of work-life balance. So we came up with this 180-100 rule, 100% pay, 80% time, provided we get 100% productivity. Now this got global headlines. We stopped counting when we got over about 14,000 articles and we got coverage all over the world. And what happened then was that people started to reach out to us and said, how did you do it? And we started to create these pilot programs, which were based around a not-for-profit that my partner Charlotte and I established. And this was where we do a coordinated six-month trial. We invite companies to join we put you through training, mentoring, network, and then backed up with a framework of international research that's coordinated out of Boston College with Professor Junior Shaw. And that's our quant research. We also have qualitative research, which is run by universities such as Cambridge. The research, the latest research is based on 91 companies three and a half thousand workers, and it's based on our research programs in the US, Ireland, uh, Australia, Canada, and the UK. Now, what you're seeing here is the benefits that organizations are seeing. Not only are employees, 90% plus of employees saying they like the four-day week, and in fact, they really don't want to go back to five-day working, but actually companies are seeing material benefits in productivity. And indeed, if you look at the research in the United Kingdom and in the United States, the revenue in the period of the trial, COVID, I admit, probably has some uh, impact on this, 
was 35% higher than of a comparable period in the prior year. And indeed, our revenue actually continued to increase throughout the periods of the trial. But it's not just, obviously, about productivity. It's also about the well-being. And what we're seeing is on broadly every single count, whether it's work-life satisfaction, stress, burnout, the time people can spend getting fit and exercising, increased ability to uh, have strong mental health, which is critical in an area where increasingly cognitive ability is part and parcel of what we need. We also found that women had greater opportunities as a consequence of this, because of course, what we're doing is we're paying on output. We are not paying on time. And therefore this benefits uh, not just men and women equally, because effectively it also means as we're pushing our men out, giving them the opportunity to spend more time with their families, you know, they can take a greater share of childcare. In our UK research, we actually saw that men spent 22% more time on childcare. We also see that when people take time out of the organization, uh, they're, ac they're actually involving themselves in low carbon activity. There has been a piece of research in the UK I'm not sure how strong it is, that suggests that if the UK adopted a four-day week, it would actually be the equivalent of taking the whole of the British private car fleet off the road every year. If I drill down to the micro levels, you know, and look at a couple of uh, results that came out of the trial, in Ireland, we found that people got an average of 42 extra minutes of sleep every night. Now, that doesn't sound a lot, but obviously it improves performance during the day. But actually, getting more sleep is actually directly linked to life expectancy. So if you give people more time off and they are able to be better rested, actually what that does is also increase their lives. In the United States, we found that people valued the four-day week so much, they said they'd need an extra 10 to 50% pay to return to a five-day work week. In the UK trial, 15% of people said, frankly, you couldn't pay us enough money to come back to a five-day week. In the UK results, we found that 71% of employees had reduced levels of burnout. And by the end of the trial, 39% were less stressed. You know, these are significant numbers. So how do you do it? I would like to say that, frankly, the research that we have done around the world has broadly proved that actually organizations, regardless of sector, are able to uh, operate effectively working four days rather than five. But the way you have to do this is actually to engage your own employees. This is not a process that you can literally go top down, uh, lay the ground rules out, say you must do things this way. What we found in company after company that the number one message we give to management is to firstly, don't overthink this. Secondly, empower your people to come up with the best ideas, because in essence, you're asking them to identify all of those little things that prevent them being as productive as they might be. And often they are very small. They're things about having a quiet hour, not being interrupted. It's reduction of meetings. It's making sure that they have their mobile phones out of reach so that they're not continuously tempted to grab the phone and have a look what's going on. So plan, absolutely. We do suggest that you enter a trial of some form, either with us or with somebody else, but do a trial, a pilot program, because in essence, you will have to find your own way. What works for me in this structure doesn't necessarily work for you.
share the ideas across the organization. We ran lots and lots of sessions where people shared what was working in one department versus another department. And then we got best practice over the time of the trial so that we were able to see what worked when we went finally to implementing it uh, completely. Get some good legal advice. Usually employment legislation doesn't support a flexible working program. In our organization, we don't close. So therefore, we have to have rotation of staff. It means there isn't a normal working week. Get some legal advice that will tell you what is capable of being done in your jurisdiction. And then do the research. By having independent qualitative and quantitative research running alongside the pilot programs, what you're able to do is give the objective outcome to both employee management, who will hate the idea in the first instance, your board, your CEO, and ultimately your customers and your shareholders. But the final point here, is this will not work unless there is trust. Because when people hear reduction to a four day week, what you don't want them to hear is that pay is gonna go down and you are going to want me to do more with less. This is about finding a better way. So as I finish up, I would say to, to all of you that this is the future. We've gone from being one little company at the bottom end of the world trialing uh, a four-day week in 2018 to what is now a global movement with legislation being being presented to reduce the working weeks in countries all over the world including the united states your biggest risk is not implementing a four-day week your biggest risk is your biggest competitor does it first well, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, and this gives us uh, about eight minutes or so for some questions, which we've been getting a lot of good ones. Right off the bat, several people in the audience have gotten pretty tactical about the ask here. And one thing I think that is top of mind is, is, is this a matter of condensing or actually subtracting? So a lot of people ask, like, is this 32 hours instead of 40 or is it condensing? your normal time into four days, which obviously leads to follow-up questions about overload. So I, I can guess at what you're gonna, how you're gonna answer this, but I'd love, I'd love for you to go into that a little more. Now we don't recommend um, keeping the working week at say 40 hours and trying to cram it into four days. There's a lot of evidence that suggests, and in fact, the productivity in those extra hours is not very high at all. We are what we say we are 80% uh, of the time. Now that means that can equally apply by the way to part-time staff as well as full-time staff. So we're looking for organizations to come on a journey to reduce the overall number of hours that their employees work. You don't have to get to 32 in one G jump. You can actually do it progressively, but it's certainly not working longer hours on four days. Got it. And, and earlier in the presentation, when you were talking about sort of the company experience and how they are rating the experience coming out of these trials, um, who are you speaking about here? Is this the, the aggregate of companies, including employees and top level management, or are you seeing different levels of feedback given the role in the organization? we're actually looking at this in the aggregate so what we do is we obviously research the, the views from a corporate perspective separately of the views of the employees but what you find really top to bottom in organizations once you've implemented the four-day week correctly that actually it benefits everybody because leaders need time to think and they need to to recharge their batteries as well as you know, the, the, the employees. So really the benefits of this actually do apply you know, from the top to the bottom of an organization, regardless of role or responsibility. 
Great. And yeah, and that dovetails nicely with some of the conversations we had earlier today about sort of managing for outcomes instead of, you know, managing um, sort of in a legacy way. And um, other questions we had coming out of this was that, you know, thinking about leadership and personas and making this shift, are there specific skills traits you're seeing in leadership teams where pilots have been more successful versus not? Yeah, look, I think the big area is that if you try and be too prescriptive, we've seen people who've been in the pilot programs or have engaged with us to implement a four-day week, where they've been absolutely prescriptive. You must do this. You must take this time off. You must follow this procedure. That sort of doesn't work. Because really what we're trying to do is to find those barriers to productivity that are different from each individual, you know, from individual to individual. So what we want them to do is find the barrier that's preventing them being productive. And if they're working with colleagues that, you know, as a team, is stopping them being productive. And, and that may well vary. So you can't have this dictatorial approach. It has to be far more collegiate. And what we find is that team building scores uh, out of a program like this literally go off the scale if you execute it correctly. That's great. And in terms of building that trust, that's another theme that has come up a lot today that in many ways, the future of work, hybrid models, you know, four day work weeks are built on real trust within teams, within the wider organization, trust and empowerment. So are there ways that you see um, companies rolling out successful sort of, uh, you know, foundations for people knowing their colleague is going to get the work done, even though there's that extra day off that week? Well, I, I mean, trust, I think, is twofold. One, the organization has to have a strong culture of trust from the top, because otherwise people hear the wrong message when you stand up and say, let's reduce working hours. You know, I'm scared it's going to impact uh, my job, I'm scared it's going to impact my salary. But when we talk about trust in the organization, that is actually cross teams. That's actually absolutely critical because nobody, in my view, goes over the top for a flag or a mission statement. They go over for the person on their left and the person on their right. And so what we do in our organizations is we set the four day week goals, the output goals on a team basis. So you have a personal responsibility. It's not just to what I am going to do, but if I waste your time so you can't do your job effectively, what that also means is that we fail as a group. So this is really about people working together. And I have to say, in five years, you know, we've only once, and that was right at the start, we had one team that failed where they didn't really get the essence of what we were trying to do. Uh, but every other team got it from the get-go. And what we've actually seen is far stronger uh, team cohesion, collaboration, ideas sharing. Because actually, I need you to succeed in order for me to get the time off that I want. That's great. And we've had a couple of questions come up in the audience, too, about uh, companies where it's a 24 or hour organization or companies that feel lean already. Um, have you found in outcomes and results from this, from these studies, any indication where one of the, the takeaways might be, we need to hire up, we need more people, like we need to spread some of this around, or are you finding that shifting schedules is still kind of working within the construct of the original team? Hey, look, there's a bit of both here, um, especially when you look at, you say, 24-hour organizations like medicine, where what you're trying to do is equally reduce shift length so you get better medical outcomes. And yes, there is some evidence that you will have to recruit a few more people. However, what you're also seeing is things like sick days reduced by 67%. So your cost of temporary staff bringing in locums in the case of medicine massive, gets massively reduced. Your ability to fill open positions gets reduced. Mistakes go down. 
So what you find often is there may in some instances be a need to recruit more, but actually your costs overall will remain broadly flat. And that seems to be pretty consistent. It, with regard to, to my organization, which I actually think is pretty lean already, We've implemented, you know, the, the four day week five years ago. We're twice as productive on a per capita basis now as our nearest competitor. Now that actually is an interesting indication of working better. And that begets more better working as well. You know, once you've found a way to be more efficient, you, often you find another idea which enables you to be even more efficient. So we're not seeing any adverse impacts of that. So I think even lean companies can find a better way. Because otherwise, let's face it, you're saying you've reached the pinnacle of human achievement in the way in which you're working you know, in your company today. Well, that's, I think, a really inspiring note to leave our audience with. And it gives lots of food for thought, I think, for teams that are thinking about implementing new ways of working and four-day work weeks. I'm actually going to turn it back to our hosts, uh, Abby Lundberg and Elizabeth Heichler, to close out today's event. Thank you so much, Andrew, for your time. Thank you. Yes, thanks for being with us, Andrew. All right. So we hope you've enjoyed this event and gotten a lot of useful takeaways. I know I learned a lot. And we will be creating a summary of all of our sessions to send to you in a couple of weeks. We'll also, we also have made a recording of the event, and we'll send you a link to that as well. In the meantime, uh, Elizabeth, what what stood out for you today? Well, I'm Andrew Barnes is my hero of the moment, <laughs> so it, 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 that that was a great note to end on, and I think that that that's so important. That's the, the maybe our next revolution. But um, well, I was very I was really impressed by the the analysis that uh, Hagen Albantian and the Workforce Sciences Institute has done. You know, showing those wage and opportunity gaps for people of color and women, and how they persist at many companies. And you know, the key here is that the research showed that people in those demographics are often just simply poorly positioned and that there are many contextual factors around why people don't advance that are completely unrelated to job performance. Um, and, you know, those disparities don't have to be baked into the culture. So I hope that managers will 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 see this and consider you know, looking at those recommendations, looking at patterns of promotion, identify what gets people ahead um, and, and consider how to more equitably provide those opportunities to more people and give more people the opportunity to be in those positions and gain the experience that they need to move ahead. Yeah, it was such a great session. Um, you know, just sort of thinking about the event broadly, the biggest takeaway for me is that we really are in the midst of a big shift. You know, workforces are expanding across lots of dimensions. How we define the workplace in both space and time is changing. And this year's speakers really delivered a lot of, um, you know, not only insight, but but sort of practical, actionable advice to help managers be successful in the years ahead. We learned from Beth Berwick that skills-based talent practices are doable and they're worth the effort. But they do require talent leaders to be intentional and make changes at every step of the talent life cycle, from recruiting and hiring to advancement and retention. George Westerman's panel demonstrated how to provide career development for all employees, not just the high performers who get all that attention in the past. And Liz Altman and David Kieran's session took the idea of workforce development for all to a completely new level as we consider all of the contributors to organizational value, not only con contractors and freelancers, but also technology co-pilots like robots and chat GPT. All of this puts pressure on managers to do things in new ways. So we're really grateful to our speakers for providing guidance in how to move forward. And we also heard about how um, employees are feeling a lot more um, pressure and stress at work, especially as pandemic has worn on and, you know, the, the, the new isolation and the challenges of that with, um, you know, the, the ups, both the goods and bad sides of, of hybrid work. I think that uh, Marty Seligman and Gabriella Rosen Kellerman's work about those five personal capabilities that are critical to well-being is so important. And, you know, we need to bolster and draw on 
all of these abilities, you know, to look ahead and plan, resilience, creativity, and innovation, um, you know, the ability to form trusting relationships with colleagues and other collaborators quickly as things change rapidly and we're, we move from team to team. And, and of course, so, you know, keep in mind our personal purpose, uh, not only for ourselves, but I think as managers, um, connecting individuals' purpose with, um, with their work. Totally. And, and when you combine that with flexible hybrid work arrangements and maybe maybe even cutting back to a four day work week, we start to see a variety of benefits to organizations and employees. And that includes, you know, better performance and a greater sense of belonging and well-being. Um, but but I think what we heard also is that these programs have to be carefully planned and, it, you know, both in terms of how work will be structured and evaluated and balancing autonomy with the need for coordination and being very intentional about creating that culture of connection and trust. And I, I think that trust is the word that, that would win the word cloud today because everybody was talking about trust. So that's it for this year. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, please take a minute to fill out our survey before you sign off. We'd love to know what you liked and what we can improve for next time. Thanks so much.